Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's Bill Burr. It's time for the Thursday afternoon, just before Friday, Monday morning podcast. Just checking in on you. Just checking to see how your week's going. You know, who's kidding who? Doing an extra half hour, making some ad read money. And usually <laughs> I just sit here running my yap, talking to myself. But lately I've had a whole bunch of guests. And uh, this guy here is at the tippy top here. The Johnny Walker Blue <laughs> of us. Uh, <laughs> sketch comedy <laughs> actors, the one and only Bruce McCullough, who has a uh, the return of his uh, off-Broadway show, Tales of Bravery and Stupidity, at the Soho Playhouse in New York City, October 14th through the 29th. Welcome, Bruce McCullough. Bill Burr, one of my friends, and I can say comedy heroes. It's so nice to be with you. I know. I haven't seen you in, in forever. How, first yes. of all, how great was that intro? I mean, I, I sound like a freaking professional there. You are a professional. You are reading for folks who are listening to this, and I don't know. There's not many. Um, <laughs> he is reading from a teleprompter. It's it's kind of it's kind of sad. And you know what happens with old guys? He's got a little white stuff in the corner of his mouth, which I, oh, I, I think know. yeah, no, which a is whisker. It's a whisker. Okay. <laughs> Did somebody tell you this was going to be a video podcast? So you could hide behind that windscreen the entire time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, that's for your sound. Is this video? So I'll take this off. This, that sounds about look at, look at Oh, there, there's the moneymaker. Check, check. I just didn't want you to know I'm wearing a wig. As we know, I have a, I have a William Shatner wig. No, you don't. You have no full hair. I yeah. On this podcast. Thank you. So, on this podcast. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I miss you, man. We did a years and years ago. We did a uh we we worked on something, and I feel like I've seen you twice since then. Yeah, and I'm so thrilled. You know the the new uh, Kids in the Hall movie, and now you got your Broadway play. If I was back there, I would definitely would, go to the show. You, come you would back have an it. you would have an excuse to not have to go to the show. I get it, um, but you should tell people what we did because it's. I remember when I saw the actually the last time I saw you was at Festival Supreme, um, and then then you started phoning me and going, dude. I'm tri I don't think you use the word triggered because you're you're too cool for that. But you went, I'm triggered again thinking about it. Because Bill and I, I I helped write and direct. I didn't direct. I, I helped write and produce a show, a pilot for Comedy Central. I guess ten years ago now, if not more. Longer than uh, that. It's like twelve uh, years ago. Yeah, with him and Kevin Hart, and it was it was about their true friendship. And my God, it was good. And it's like if that one's not going to go, and I I think it was a money thing that. You know, probably not Bill's people, but probably. I don't know. Oh, Kevin's is that what people. it was? I think that's what it was. Because yeah. he, he was just blown up there. Remember when he used to bring um a, a knapsack filled with money that he'd get on the road, which I'm sure you've got a knapsack now with your own. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't remember that. I just remember that he would. Uh, the reason why the show was going to work, I felt, was because we were complete opposites where I would just show up in my Prius and he would show up in like a Hummer with like, you know, 10 of his friends hanging around the set and everything. We were complete opposites. We were basically playing um, what are exaggerated versions of ourselves. Right. And then we gradually, we started off happy and it was going to get darker with our drinking issues and all of that yeah. type of stuff. But we never got that far. And you, you were directing it. And I didn't uh, direct it. I produced it. Oh, see, I didn't. Yeah. I thought you were directing that. Yeah, I just remember you came out one time and gave direction and made me laugh my ass off. You did it like <laughs> you just were. You were. You were almost. You were imitating a director being an asshole. And me oh. and Kevin just started laughing. And I just said to him, "I go, dude, if this gets picked up, how much fun is this going to be?" Aw, uh, yeah. And what and happened? That, it went we right to the shitter. Shitter, yeah. Um, but a funny story from that show. It's not about you, so you you, you won't mind me telling it. I remember because. You know, Kevin Hart's great, but sometimes a little bit late, just a little tiny bit late. Um, he came <laughs> really late to a writer's session that was at my house for some reason. I didn't know I had that uh, amount of power. And he wrote on an index card, I, Kevin Hart, promised not because he had been drinking uh, to drink for 24 hours. And then he crossed it out. And, went, that. and then he crossed it out and went 23 hours, <laughs> 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 which I thought was so funny. Yeah. But here we are. Yeah. It's not like he came in like blasted or anything. He was, dude, that guy was like 27 years old making <laughs> movies and stuff. So he had clubs to go to at night. I don't fault that. Yeah. 
I, I think they invented bottle service for him at that time. I'm not saying anymore. It was. I think that I think that that's what it was. Yeah, but it was going to be uh, it was going to be a lot of fun. And I think the, this business realized it. So they were like, no, we can't do that. You know, what's funny. Right. As I said, it was going to be a lot of fun. And they took it away. You literally went like this, like you were imitating hanging yourself. I like, almost hung yourself. myself with my I don't want I don't want to say it. Three hundred dollar scarf. Who am I? Whatever. Three hundred on a scarf. You know what yeah, <laughs> it's gone. It's already. I've already gifted. It was the lifetime achievement award for. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's what they give in Canada. They give you in theater here. They give you scarves because. Hey, what what to... part of Canada are you from? Are you you Toronto? What where are you? Oh God, no! I'm from Alberta. Um, oh, where? God, you're an animal. Oh, I'm an animal. I was I was born in Edmonton. I actually you won't even. Oh, that's it. a little cut above. A little cut. The, I, the cattle down you. south. The oil men are up top. I get it. Let me show you the. I guess you can't really see it. Cheese crowd. There's a there's a scar from a knife fight I had in the Calgarian Hotel when I was 19 years old. So I've I was through the wars as a young man. Wait, a knife like you had a knife too? Where this guy pulled a no, knife? No, no, a guy actually cut me with a knife. There was there was a phase bill, and you probably remember this, where guys would have cowboy hats, but they'd have little feathers on the front of them, uh-huh. were like like little I don't know what they were, and I I guess I'd. It kind of had pissed me off, so I decided to take his little feather off. Oh, you and don't I was, do that. You don't, you don't take a man's feather off his cowboy hat. So that's that's what happened. And I was so hard. No, 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 slow down, slow down. So what? you're in this bar. Yep. All five foot four of you, right? <laughs> well, I, I tower in at five six, but correct. Five six, and you walk up to John Wayne looking guy in Alberta, <laughs> which for those yep. Americans, that's like the Texas of of Canada as far as cattle oil. <laughs> You know, go fuck yourself, be a man, let's get a gun and that type of shit. So you go in there, coming yep. from a sketch class, and decide, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna imitate I'm gonna improv with this guy. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm... throw the ball by taking his feather out of his hat. <laughs> and, see, and see what he does. And of course, Bill, as you know, I was wearing nurse shoes at the time, which is what I often often work that was my go-to for my drinking shoes. Because they were so comfortable and they were so punk to me. What is your deal, dude? How did you grow up in that place so friggin' macho and like that is not your vibe at all? So what was so you you grew up out there and everybody's fucking punching cattle and drilling oil and flattening the mm -hmm. mountains and you you're you're doing what? Reading Jack Kerouac and I was reading Jack Kerouac. Um I uh, yeah, <laughs> well and listening to, you know, it it was probably not even punk. Yeah, I guess it was punk music by then cuz I was 18, so that was, you know, 77. So um yeah, no, I, I grew up in reaction to the place uh, that I was. I would dress, I would dress, I'd wear pink shirts and they would chase, men in trucks would chase me down the street uh, to beat me up and scream, you know what word they screamed at me, and um, not hero. Scream they didn't faggot at you. I mean, <laughs> that's what they would scream. Say what they called you. You just don't call somebody that. <laughs> that's, that's, the, I guess that's correct. At this point, you can get, you can literally get in trouble for saying the slur that was said to you. Yes, that that I came out from under, which is why when I wrote running F word, as we like to call it now um, on the show, it was that it was like, oh, no, uh, gay men are heroes. We are we're heroes for folk heroes for living through what people in Alberta and people in Toronto uh, put them through. So what you just decided that you were just going to like. What gave you the strength that like how how irritated were you by the uh, I mean, it's a pretty testosterone place, Alberta. Like at what point was it just for the sheer like, uh, you know, it's like a stand up comedian. You go up and you're just like, all right, these people are into this. So I'm going to make fun of this. This is their home team. I'm going to make fun of their home team. Was it just simply like that or had something else happened? What happened to you before the pink shirt is what I want to know. Well, you know. Not to be too serious, I come from a pretty rotten childhood. My dad was uh, a boozer and a salesman. He was good at being a boozer and not good at being a salesman. Um, my mom left, Bill, when I was seven years old. I wasn't allowed to have a picture of her or talk to her. I didn't talk to her for two years. It's and like so, country song. yeah. And then my, my stepmom, Connie, uh, who I, I'd often say, you're not Francis? my real mom. What's that? Francis? I I wish. Oh my God! Now you made me think of Connie Francis. And they were they were boozers. So I I, you know, and I had the house that you couldn't bring people home because 
my dog would have binky would have attacked my dad my my mom might be asleep on the stairs connie from having drunk her hudson's bay rye since eight in the morning and so i found basically first it was blue oyster cult punk music and then it was punk music right Mm -hmm. and then of course i fought (laughs) it just i that's amazes me that like you you're just like the nicest soft-spoken person you must be a terror on set now you no. get into a, you get into like a knife fight and all of this stuff. So like, um, did you get tired of getting your ass kicked? Did you enjoy it? Did you fight back? Oh no, when, I, when I, I no, I wasn't as good. I, and there was an there's an actor that you may know, Callum Keith Rennie. He was in um, what's that show he was in? Oh well, look him up. Uh, he was we, we went to high school together, and he's he's become a, quite a good actor. He was in Californication and a few things. We would fight together. He was a good fighter. I was good at just, you know, bleeding, quite honestly. You were the hype but, man. <laughs> yeah, I was the hype man. But I started going, I had friends who had moved out to Toronto and I started going to Toronto where there was people like me, right? And there was music and there, you know, and the Buzzcocks played and the Damned played. And I wanted to get to Toronto as soon as possible. And when our show, we had a show in Calgary that became successful when I started doing comedy, I wanted to go to Toronto right away. And it wasn't for the comedy. It was for the music. That's amazing. So where, where did you meet? Uh, well, first of all, how did you get from Alberta to to Toronto? Did you did you have any money to just fly out there? Did you get in a piece of shit car and drive across? What, what are you, Saskatchewan? Well, <laughs> what well a few things. There? I worked, I worked uh, loading trucks and driving truck for Canada Dry. And what, what you could do in the old days was you'd go out to your boss and you go, um, can you put me on compensation for a while? Because I want to leave town. And they'd say, sure. That was because that's the old, like the warehouse thing. So I kept getting these beautiful golden Canadian checks for two weeks. And then the other thing is we had worked at a really great theater, which uh, did theater sports, which, you know, is improv, competitive improv uh, comedy. And so we... That. Oh, we started doing our show after the theater sports show. And then we started attracting an audience. And by we, you're talking about the guys who eventually became kids in the hall or just your friends? A bunch of people. But uh, you might know the name Mark McKinney was the Fair one enough. guy. Yeah. And so we started selling. T- they start, We started selling out this show at 11 at night. And then when we left town and nobody got paid for theater sports and they still don't. Same with UCB. Um, they... <laughs> They said, hey, you guys have been great. Um, you, We've added up all the money that you made. And we're giving you, they gave me, they gave us each for $4,200. Because we've been that, working there like, for two years. Unheard of. And it's like, what? And so we had that money as well. So then you, you flew. Oh, we flew. Yeah, we're not driving. No, no. And I think a, I think a plane ticket then would have been $78 one way. <laughs> Did anybody who ever beat you up, you ever see him in the crowd when you were up there doing your thing at the improv sports? No, or but a, just a but, different crowd. No, but a sideways story. When I was um, when I was 15, I went to see Kiss. Do you know the band Kiss? Bill? I've heard of them. Yeah. yeah. And they were so they didn't even have a record out yet. And I was, it was at a nurse's cabaret at the U of uh, Toronto or sorry, U of Calgary. And I, wait, what is a nurse's cabaret? They, the nurse's department at school puts on a cabaret and anybody can go. So it's like four bucks. I thought it was a bar where just nurses went to and drank. I'd be, I'd be there. Wouldn't you bill? Um, And I, uh, yeah, to watch you lose a knife fight to a nurse wearing your, (laughs) wearing her shoes. Hey, those are my shoes. Give them back, you bitch. Um, and uh, I, uh, so Gene Simmons, and we were making fun of Kiss because they were the silliest thing we'd ever seen in our life. And they had a little Kiss like thing that was aluminum, had like aluminum foil on it, like the big Kiss logo, but it was like two feet tall, sort of like the spinal tap joke. And we were making fun of them. And then we saw Gene Simmons go get a blood pellet and go, and he split, spit his blood all out and stuff like that. And we we're going, you're such a joke. You're such a stupid old man. And we we're screaming at him. He came down with still playing his big bass and said, I'm going to fucking kill you, kid. And <laughs> he did. And then 
Um, Wait, Gene Simmons beat the shit out of you? He didn't, but he came back for his revenge. Um, 30 years at least later. But if this was the 70s, he was, he was like a, he was like a, well, you know, Anybody who's a year older than you oh, is old. Is old. Um, but he um, was too old for dress up. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, and then like 35 years later, I look up in it when I'm living in LA on my uh at my long driveway, and getting out of a black SUV is Gene Simmons. And so it's like, okay, he's here to beat the shit out of me. It just took him a long time. No. He wasn't though. He was. I think he had a son or something that was in a house oh, near okay. me or something like that. So that's like, that's wow, my... man, That's like some Sicilian shit. If he came back I, that later, I, I should have said to him, "Okay, I know why you're here," but I didn't. That's hilarious that you were like heckling them. It's also amazing that they had that little sign and they and that everybody's laughing at it. But that was their dream, and then it just kept getting bigger and, and bigger. And we didn't know that it was going to be. They were going to be so good. And then I actually saw them a couple years later. Um, with Cheap Trick, it, and they were they were pretty fantastic. They were actually a pretty, uh, you know, I don't listen to them now, but they actually were a pretty good rock band. Not bad for a bunch of old men. You finally gave it up. Yeah, it feels like mm -hmm. the end of the episode where you just sort of uncross your arms. Yeah, or but maybe uh, and but the, yeah, the people from the network want you to do one of these. Thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> um all right so then you go you get you go to toronto all right and then you, you start you just you were you went there for the music did you play because i remember in like your sketches and stuff there was a lot of lot of uh guitar playing and stuff would come up a lot um i remember you singing you know the fuck the bank i don't remember did you ever play guitar fuck the bank was one of my favorite ones ever oh thank you um i i play uh, i play a little guitar I dabble. I have a Fender Mustang for you guitar aficionados out there. And I have a Beatle bass, the Paul McCartney Beatle bass that my dad played because he was not just a drunk and a salesman. He was also played bass in bands. Oh, he was a jack of all trades. He was a jack of all trades, but mostly a boozer, Bill. Bill what I find with your dad is he likes to pick jobs where it's easy to get drunk. <laughs> Salesman, bass player. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I always say that he he died 30 years sober. His um they threw him off a reservation in Galician, Alberta, um, for being too drunk. And that was his low point. And then he didn't drink again. Wow. What a happy story. No, it just it's okay, Bill. You got no that, No, that's it's just a, you know. No, you you look at you have like movies. There's like three movies in all of this. <laughs> So you wonder why I was such a little punk, right? And that makes sense. Yeah, but I, I I didn't know that you you like you went out of your way to get your ass kicked. I mean, I didn't even do that. I mean, I, I was a wise ass, but when you know, first time I got my ass kicked, I was like, all right, I'm going to stick to the jokes. Well, when I Just, but the truth is, when I because I thought I really thought society is fucked. All you people are fucked. You know what I mean? Like every and I didn't know that there was people like you out there, or the people that I, you know, I had sit I had. Two friends, or th maybe four friends. Two were in the Shadowy Men from a Shadowy Planet, which was our our band, the Kids in the Hall band, and two other guys, and that was it. No other friends, and then everybody else was stupid, and that was you know the old days when it's like if you weren't a uh, a jock and you didn't, well, I did some drugs, but you know you weren't a rich kid. What were you? You were like us, these weirdos, and right. so. But there's, and of course, those are the old days before the internet bill and weirdos can't find each other, right? As they can now, which is the beautiful thing about the internet. Well, they always found each other in cities. You just go to yes. the, the art, whatever the hippies, the art people were, that's where you would find the fellow weirdos. Yeah. It is interesting. I always like that about cities. And then like people who are business minded, they just look for the glass towers. They go there or the steakhouses or something. And then meatheads like me. Oh, like you've got a sports arena, <laughs> you know, do you have a, a bar with a bunch of sports logo things? And then you just kind of, you kind of find like your group. That's why I, I, I feel like living in a city in, 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 you know, as much as there's violence and crime and that type of shit, it's easier to find the group of weirdos that, that you, that you, uh, that you associate with, but it is kind of funny 
that like people that are into sports aren't, you know, that, that just for some reason became like this mainstream, like, like that was somehow cool. You didn't play them. You just were like, like if you go into a sports bar and you just look at guys and all these animals, it's like these fucking, no one here could run the block without doubling over wheezing. And they know everything about sports. Somebody finally, somebody comedian did a great bit saying what's the, like was comparing star Wars freaks to sports fans and just made all of these parallels of like knowing the names and dressing up like, you know, you dress up like the character, you dress up like the player. And I was just sitting there wanting to be like, this isn't right. And I listened to it. I was like, yeah, that's kind of a hundred percent. Right. <laughs> well, it's it's also, and I, I actually remarked this to one of my friends the other day. It was like, cause there was a Jays game. It's like, why would you put the name of somebody else on your back? Or would you get a shirt that said Burr on the back? Like you're going to get a. That's actually worse. Yeah, I would rather worse. appear as as uh, you know a, a professional player's boyfriend than to actually <laughs> never make it in the league and have my own name on the back. I, I did it one time uh, when uh, I, I got to throw out the first pitch at Boston, but it made sense because they put Burr in twenty two, like the right. year yeah. that I did it. So when I'm an old man, be like, I did things. Way but back I, in 22. I heard that pitch bounce twice before it got to home plate. Is that true? Oh, dude, it bounced right <laughs> up your fucking pink ass. <laughs> right to the plate. <laughs> but but you like that. You like to go to a sports bar and go, I, how can I cheer for people who don't give a fuck about who I am? Oh, here's the place. <laughs> yeah, I, I this. You know what happened? Sports kind of like everything kind of got like overexposed. And it used to just be... Like, you know, it was like football. It was on once a week and they had a little half hour show beforehand on this little thing. And then there was Jimmy the Greek and he was giving you, you know, the odds on who to bet on. Brent Musburger, Irv Cross. And it was a Jackie Kennedy or something like that. Jane Kennedy. And that was the crew. And you just watch them and then you just watch the game and the game was over and that was it. But there right. wasn't any, all of this this talk and like, you know, this fucking bullshit now with like, you know, getting involved in players. Oh, this guy's getting a divorce or this guy got a DUI and all of that stuff. Like, I don't know. It was but it's sports radio is what did it. I couldn't believe because I actually became a huge Jay ESPN fan. two, 24 yeah. hours of that. And then have an ESPN one, two, three university. I mean, I love it that since there's all those games on it. But like it became like MTV where they were like, well, we got to fill up all this time. We can't keep showing sports for whatever they thought that reason. And then they just started sitting around talking and they they fucking argue and just yell at each other. And it's just every time I hear them yelling, it's just like, guys, you're in your 40s. Who gives a fuck? I, I know. I know. And I, I, I loved I loved the call in shows, too, because it's like someone would call in and and like go on against Garth Org, who's only hitting 162 and he should be back to Syracuse. And I also love when the guy, guys, of course, only guys, women are way too smart for this, aren't you, women? Oh, there's no women listening to this. Um, uh, <laughs> they'd phone up and they'd go, they'd go, so who's who's going to win the game tonight? It's like, who do you think is going to win the game tonight? Like, dude, we don't have no idea who's going to win the game. I know. Either the Blue Jays or the Milwaukee Brewers. So why are yeah. you asking? No, they, and then they got the whole the fantasy things. The only reason why I like people that play fantasy football and baseball is it's, it seems to be the best way now. To know the to know what's going on and know people's stats and everything. When I was a thank you. When I was a kid, they had uh, you know, like trading cards. And I didn't even realize right. that like instead of looking at my multiplication tables, I would have been a whiz at math if I if I looked at those things <clears> as much <throat> as I, I looked at my football cards. I knew people's heights, I knew what where they went to college, I knew their hometown, all of this stuff, what years they were all pro, if they went all pro last year, because I had all of that. And somewhere along the line, trading cards, because all of them from the 50s and 60s and 40s were worth so much money, it became an adult pursuit and they pushed the kids out of it. And it was in early 2000s. I started I wanted to collect again because I, I didn't know who the players were because I was doing so much stand up. And I went down to this hobby shop or whatever, if they still have those. And there was a bunch of guys, and it was down in New York near the financial districts. And there was these guys, like the, the Wall Street guys were down there. And I saw this guy, and he was just throwing away cards. He called them common cards. And those are basically ones that weren't going to be worth any money. And it was like totally an investment. And I was like, 
I was thinking like, why would you throw those cards? Can I have those cards? I would love those cards, right? <laughs> and then I kind of looked around the store. And I was like, oh my God, it's all like, we were all like guys in like our 30s. And I was like, where are the kids? Like they should be like down here. Um, I should look like some weirdo being here. And uh, I guess I guess now it's like fantasy football is kind of the way to do it. Well, and so you did you not collect buy any cards then? You you said now. Well, I then when I hate it, because I just wanted to like get the collection and look at it and get to know the players as like a studying tool, you know? And because all of these these guys, these guys, just Christopher Walken there, these guys all of a sudden had all this money. They could just buy a complete set and they could buy numerous sets. So it was it was flooding the market with cards and driving the price down. So what they did was they deliberately made cards rare and hard to get. It's like the oil companies. They just right. stop producing oil and then the, the price of gas goes up and then whoever's president gets fucking blamed. Right. So they were doing that with cards. And I was just and it, the whole thing was just like, ah, oh, man, this isn't like this isn't the fun of what it used to be. You go and you buy packs and like you only need one more card. and You're like, fuck. I just need one more card. And then you call up your, 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 you know, at school, one of your friends had doubles of it. And then you'd give him, have to give him like three cards that he needed. It was this whole, we used to have like trading card sessions. Like me and my siblings and the kids in the neighborhood, we would just go into somebody's house, bring all your cards, and you just broke out what you had. Uh, I did that too. Oh, man, you got three Tony Door like, sets. <laughs> what, what do you want for that? Nah, man, I love Tony Door. You got to give me more than that. It was incredible. And it was well, like totally innocent. And then by 2000, you know, it was guys like me fucking the whole thing up by trying to go yeah. in and buy a complete set. Yeah. I remember that too. Got it. Got it. Need it. Got it. Need it. Need it. it. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And then it became like, don't write on the checklist. <laughs> I know. Oh, right. And somehow it's the checklist became worth a lot of money because that was like, you know, you could tell what card it was. I yeah. don't know. What does this have to do with the fact that you're doing off Broadway? Now, let me let me ask you this. Yeah. Do you have to get to the theater early so you can get into character? I know a lot of you actors do that stuff. And you have to I make... like to go as as early as 30 minutes before the show. I like I, that. The, I, I'm, not the, I'm not the person who goes there for three hours. I know some actors, real actors who go, mama, 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 mommy. You, you walk into their dressing rooms. Mommy, mommy, mommy. Who am I, mommy? Um, no, um, I go. <laughs> da, da, dee, da, da, do. Yeah. I go with my winning spirit, Bill, which you've you've witnessed firsthand. You've worked with me. And you're a man of the uh, people. You're out and about with everybody. You know, you have a couple of fucking pints. I don't have pints, but I do I I do go uh, gracefully on stage um and lay it down for the you people. You walk through a makeup mister before you go <laughs> on there just to kind of yep. freshen you um, up. And then I just say girdle. And then somebody, you know, from Nassau comes and gives me a girdle. <laughs> How long is the show? It's seven. Uh, it's seventy-five minutes, and lately I've been uh, I've been using you in my show. No, you, you know haven't. That? I have. I I do a thing. I talk about like it's okay if you don't get one of my jokes because if you don't get one of my jokes, it goes over your head and to the end of the universe and waits for me there, which which I sort of love as a just a weird thing. And then I go and I also I love the low, and for some reason one night I said Bill Burr can handle the low. And they loved it. So every night, every night I go, Bill Burr can't handle the lull. And I think of you. That's amazing. You know how cool yeah. that is <laughs> for me, just growing up being a fan of you, you know, because I'm so much younger than you. Oh, yeah, uh, you're a child. I, no, I'm not. But look at you. Yeah, yeah. You look like an old Superman. <laughs> <laughs> I look like a ruined astronaut. You used to you look like you used to save Gotham or whatever. Oh, Gotham's <laughs> Batman. Yeah. Uh, no, you do. You have uh, you have that. Uh, you're too. You're too like nice and sweet to have led a, like a life of politics and just seeing the underbelly. <laughs> um, I feel like you're that guy that people just go. You know, he really gets life. Yeah. He just well, he understands it. <laughs> Until they get to know. No, they like me. How old is your son now? He's got to be like what, eighteen? No, he turns Otis turns fifteen tomorrow. My daughter turns eighteen next week. Yeah, but he's wow. he's you funny. Did it. He's funny. I know we can almost we can almost do it. Like he's very funny. 
Um, up until I do a show called uh, Tall Boys uh, uh, in in Canada, which is a great sketch show. It's Amer available in the U.S. now, but which went three seasons or th three seasons so far. But before that, a lot of my shows only went one season. Like mm -hmm. I did a show with my wife, Young Drunk Punk, and a few other things. And he called me Mr. One Season. <laughs> <laughs> Like, good morning, awesome. Mr. One Season. <laughs> I've been, I already told this story in the podcast, but I'll tell it again for you. My daughter came up to me one day and she goes, she goes, hey, dad. She goes, I know what your real name is. I go, oh, yeah, what's my real name? She kind of like pushed her face out. She goes, it's Bill. And I go, oh, yeah. I go, how do you know that? She goes, because I hear mommy say that to you. I go, all right. I go, you want to know what my full legal name is? You want to know what it is? And she goes, what? I go, it's William Frederick Burr. She goes, that's ridiculous. <laughs> I go, what? I and she that. just laughed. I go, what? Why is it ridiculous? She goes, it's a ridiculous name. And laughed and just walked into the kitchen. And she still won't get off it. She keeps, but she, I think it's a word she learned at school because I asked her, I said, um, she came in the, in the morning. She goes, dad, can I look at my tablet? And I, tablet? And I said, no. And she goes, that's ridiculous. And it just, every time she says it, I burst out laughing. So I think that she she knows it's like a joke, but I don't think she knows how to like <laughs> use the word. That's what I'm hoping. Or maybe I do have a ridiculous name. I don't know what, but she. It's pretty ridiculous, Bill. I mean, we, we're I, all she's kind of getting in my head because she hasn't <laughs> wavered. I'm waiting for her to be like, no, dad, I was just kidding. She said to me the other day, she goes, dad, you're fat. Right. And I go, <laughs> I go, you think I'm fat? She goes. No, you're not fat. I go, okay, good. She goes, no, you are fat. And she goes, you need to go to the gym. And then she she starts hitting my stomach and she's going like, you need to go to the gym. <laughs> you need to go to the gym. Hi, ho, the dairy. And she just started cracking up laughing. She's right, too. I got a nice fucking double cheese sandwich here. I'm trying yeah, to look. Yeah, Nia sent her to, to do that to you. I know. Yeah, Nia, you know. Nia's yeah. about ready to trade me in on a younger model. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Well, of course. You know, I, I had a ginger hair. The, the last time I went to uh, the doctor in LA, he said, I go, we got to talk about your end of life protocols. And I said, Oh, okay. And he said, you have any? And I said, well, um, when I die, my wife, Tracy, who you met many years ago, um, she can't remarry for two weeks. <laughs> and, and, and he, he, he laughed and then he wrote it down, which I think is fantastic. So that is. you give him one last laugh. Yeah. Fortnite, guys. I know, I know you're circling. So you know, I had a doctor recently go like, you know, there's no good at your age. There's there's no good news from here on out, and it's just like, why would you say that? It's like I know that, but why would you put me in that mindset? That's like being a coach. Like, you know, there's no way we can win tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At least we could we could keep it close. We could give the people a game, or you can only play this sport until you're 28. You know, even if you're really good, that's. Why would a coach say that to a kid? You know why? Because they grew up in Alberta. Yeah. <laughs> the whole problem with the whole Northern Hemisphere <laughs> all comes down to Alberta and Texas. Because these true. liberals, man, they just, <laughs> they have, did you ever think liberals would become such fucking psychos? No, I no, I didn't. I mean, Jesus I, Christ, so, just so fucking intolerant and just have, I used, I used to think I was, I don't know where I am now. All I know no. is that if I go to Texas, uh, hey, how's Joe Biden there? Let's go fucking rickety raggedy, whatever they say. Let's go Bucky or whatever they say. <laughs> and then when I'm out here, I'm like, I'm like fucking counting the days until Trump comes back. <laughs> I'm well, kind of like where you were when you were young. I think I'm going to start saying society. Yeah, society is no good. I well, I like to go to a uh, dinner party and say, especially when people don't know me, and go, "Well, Trump's got some good ideas." Oh, that's fantastic! And just to, just to hear people like that, blah blah blah. blah. That's but, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to use that. I remember when we stayed at the Trump Hotel in Chicago, and uh, there was people protesting outside, like the fucking guy was in there. You know what I mean? Like he actually is has any attachment to that hotel other than loaning him. He's a brand. He's basically a socialite. So the, the same way like Kim Kardashian will loan her name to, to a brand, you know, make some money. He does that with the hotels. He's not fucking in there. These dumbass liberals are out there fucking screaming and yelling. 
And we were going in, they were yelling at us. I'm like, I didn't vote for the guy. They go, ah, fuck you. They're all screaming. So then the rest of the weekend, we would get out of the car. We would just say positive shit about Trump. You know? I just get out. I'll tell you about Donnie, man. I don't think he goes far enough. They'd be like, you fucking And then we That's were hilarious. drinking. I was still drinking at the time. We were behind glass. And and I'm not going to say the other comic, but we were knocked on the glass and we were going, four more years. <laughs> And just laughing the whole time, just being like, if they only knew that I I, I voted for uh, I voted for that crazy old uh, the guy from Back to the Future there, who's the guy they 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 wouldn't let him in every time. And but don't you remember like maybe in the eighties or ninety when you thought the world's just going to get cooler and Bernie cooler. Sanders, that's what yes, I voted for. Bernie Sanders. But the world's just going to get more open. We're going to make discoveries. It's and then all of a sudden like. What happened? It's not, we're not more liberal. Some people, it's, I don't know what happened. No, I think, I think, uh, you know, I think the internet happened. The internet right. happened and it turned it into one giant townie bar. And then moron liberals and moron conservatives can now exchange ideas. And they, we've kind of created this thing now where you only listen to things that agree with you and it makes you feel good. And you're like, yeah. You know, like that, like I find CNN and Fox, other than uh, like treasonous, they're hilarious to watch because they just sit there doing this the whole time. Like, I tell you, this country would be great if everybody had on a blue tie. And then the other one, everybody needs a red tie. It's like, I I don't, I don't know. I don't know how many times the government can just turn their backs. Like what they did, you know, what they did in New Orleans, right? What they did in Mississippi. Huh? What they did in Alberta? Yeah. I didn't have another city. I'm just saying, like, how many fucking times can they just just show you that you don't fucking matter? Oh, and listen, we, we you know, not to get serious here, we, people in America always think that Canada is really great and we really also take care of our First Nations people. We have the worst record. There is so there is millions of people up north who do not have clean drinking water. And they, why don't they have drinking water? Like every time anybody says anything, all I can say is, but why don't they have clean drinking water? Isn't that what everybody's been saying for 40 years? They need clean drinking water. You know what I think I open with when I do Canada? Hmm. Like, oh, up here in Canada, I, I know you guys. You guys think you're the best white people. <laughs> you're a cut above. And I go, There's, there was people here before you got here. Where are they? Send them up north. <laughs> crying on a fucking canoe um and then i go into my act this is not okay. a shirt sure. oh nice yeah it's a cigar uh, place that treated me and mike bertolina and kenny fetter very nicely in phoenix arizona it's called he's wearing a he's wearing a fine ass cross promoting shirt so please if you're in the phoenix region area uh yeah. please go in why do you have to do a show in new york when i'm not there I don't know. You know, I'm going to tell a funny Bill Burr story. I like how you answered that. Like that was a good question. I don't know. I should have checked with you. Yeah, it's the, I should have. Um, We, I remember we played Boston, the kids in the hall uh, a little while ago, I think on our last tour. And we were little theater, small theater. I think it was like a 500 seater. And we just, we did maybe four shows. And then we thought, oh, that's pretty good. We went clean as we like to call it for four shows. And then we looked, and after us was Bill Burr. I think you did 16. Oh, at that, yeah, yeah, I did a run of shows. I'm from it. Yeah, I know, but still. That's like like you bringing your pink shirt one-man show back to Alberta. I mean, how many shows could you do? I mean, it would be endless. (laughs) There's still guys there who want to beat me up, so maybe they're going to take another. Well, you know what? Uh, John Mulaney came and and, and, uh, incinerated, disintegrated my record. So he, he has the record. And I'll tell you that fine young man, he can have it. Yeah, yeah, you can. That, that was that was quite the albatross around my neck. Everybody talking about it all the time. Everybody on the streets. You no know, guys in sketch. You know, years later. Are you still yeah, doing that edgy that, material? I, I heard. I heard you were in that chuckle hut. And <laughs> Thirteen shows. Am I still doing edgy? Yeah, I, yeah. I push. I push the envelope. You know. Yeah, it's it's wild. You know it I, I like to try to make people think. Do you yeah. know. Oh my God! I remember. It does, do you? Yeah, yeah, I didn't know. I hadn't seen that. That's I haven't that, felt that yet in this special. podcast. No, you you did one piece. It's like I always think it's like, how did he get away with this one? Which I don't know if you've ever thought that about my material, but it's like 
where you talked about you can't talk to kids because you don't want them to think you're a pedophile. And then you go on to say that you think some of their parents sort of fatten up these kids so they won't be attractive to pedophiles. Yeah. It's like, how how do you get away with Shut that? Shut the head off the snake. <laughs> <laughs> that was my, oh, he didn't. No, I just, yeah. because, yeah. you know, if you, if you don't mean anything, if you're not being malicious. Yeah. I mean, here's you should the- hear my new chunk I'm doing on how not to get raped. Oh, my God. And Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Just why would I? Yeah, why? Why wouldn't you try to help people that could that could potentially happen to? That's true. Could That's happen true. to you too. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I, I'm helping uh, everybody with my comedy. See, most people just go out and they tell jokes. Not me. Yeah. I try to. <laughs> I try to go like have a PSA attached to every shit joke that I do. <laughs> I'll do a shit joke and go. Remember to get your colon checked. <laughs> I think that's a scam. By the way, they just yeah. keep lowering the age. First, it was just like, you know, when you're 103, you should probably have a camera crew up your ass. Then it got dropped down to 70. It was like the speed limit. It just keeps going down and down there for a while. Now it's down to like 38. Next year, they're going to say, if you have an asshole, let us stick a camera up. <laughs> now, is this all a new yacht. bit you're working on? Are you like fucking what? Scott Thompson? You're trying out your material on me? How dare you? <laughs> How dare you compare to that that horrible man? I've worked with them numerous times. Jeez, just browbeating everyone in the green room. No, I haven't seen him in forever. Yeah. Well, you're. I I almost came to see you when you were in Toronto, but then I realized it was at night. I think you're saying. Then I realized I had better things to do. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I so, actually so, something came up. I but, had some neo punk band I had to go see down at the fucking <laughs> the attic or whatever. I had the to name go was. see the vile tones. Oh. Yeah. Who else? Were you like into REM? Uh yeah. But REM. That, I'm trying to I'm trying I'm trying to get your 80s playlist here. That's a little soft for me, I think. How about John R- Kruger and the Beaver Brown band or whatever that fucking movie was called? <laughs> Dark Science, nothing, nothing is real. You know, with your cow lick flipping around. You never did a cover of that in your band? Yeah. <laughs> no, no. On uh, the dark side. No. Eddie and the cruisers. Oh, Eddie and the Cruisers. Yeah, that's what it was. It was something John something in the Beaver Brown Bear. Oh yeah. Oh, uh, it was John Cougar and then John Cougar Mellencamp and then John Mellencamp. Yeah, I knew him when he was John Cougar. I got his first record. When he was just John Cougar. Oh yeah. Did you guys yeah. hang around and make fun of Gene Simmons? I wish. <laughs> no. <laughs> Dude, I think that that's what's missing from a John Cougar Mellencamp, uh, Brody Stevens Stevens show. <laughs> Is he should have a uh, he should have a fucking he should have a blood pellet in his mouth <laughs> when he sings Little Pink Houses and then it's pink pellet. <laughs> I love that. And, and I actually shoes. one of my favorite drummers of all time, Kenny Aronoff, played with him, and I specifically went to go see whatever he was going by then. John Mellencamp will say I specifically went to go see him to see Kenny Aronoff, and Kenny did not disappoint. I had lawn seats at, um, it was called Great Woods. You know, John Cougar came out and just fucking, I mean, the guy just has hit after hit after hit. And, uh, but I was just hold the whole show. All I looked at was Kenny Aronoff bringing the hand up, slamming it down on the snare. And I was like, that is a pro drummer. And that's what I'm going to be. And then I started playing <laughs> drums and it didn't work out. <laughs> it's not as easy as it looks. It's not just doing it on your lap at a party, right, Phil? Uh, you know. I thought I was grooving in the back of the station wagon, you know, but then when I actually sat down behind the kit, I had to put on my big boy pants. I kind of fell off the back of the stool. That's what happened. Nice. Do you always do this to people? What? You just sort yeah. of make them go through their sad memories, like sort of a little white. Yeah. yeah. Doing right I'm now? kind of like a Willie Loman of comedy where uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I take up my sad samples and then you you start telling showing me your sad samples. You know, oh, sort of this. and then we all pick them up at the edge of infinity <laughs> because we like saying that. Yeah, I like saying that. It, and but those jokes are waiting for me there. Don't you get that, Bill? That's that's about the circle of life. And I don't know why I've worked <laughs> with you. I've taught you everything I knew. But why can't you see that? <laughs> so what do you think when you what happens when you die? When you die, do you then go visit all your jokes that didn't work in Soho? Yeah. I mean, I actually. The, and they all hug you and be like, yeah. we were funny. We were waiting for you, Bruce. 
We've always been here for you, Bruce, since the beginning of time till the end of time. No, I know that when I die, um, A, my wife remarries with it after two weeks. and But I also know that the opiates in my brain just stop working and that's it. Oh, I did leave my body to science. This is a joke I'm going to do for you, Bill. Um, and But they're going to shoot it out of a cannon, apparently. Oh, that's awesome. That's yeah. a very that's a very conservative thing to do. I like that. Yeah. yeah. That's a red state thing to do. Yeah. And then I send your they're... liberal body to a red state so they can shoot it. <laughs> the cannon. And I presume wild animals would eat it still, I guess. <laughs> what was left? Yeah, oh, and it's got to you got to be naked too because you don't want to try to eat through your clothes. God no, you give got the to, clothes. You got to be so to the, to the meth people. Well, and of course I'm going to die naked. That's just what I'm going to do, Bill. Oh, I'm I, I'm I'm done. My body's going to be like a parts car where you just take a carburetor here and a kidney over there, and then they're, they're throwing me in the oven, and then that's it. What if they go? Ah, eh, don't want it. And then the other guy goes, "Why?" And go, "I saw one of his shows once. It wasn't so good." I feel like if you, what if you die? What if like, if I live to be, you know, fucking old as shit. I mean, who wants an 80 year old guy's kidney? You got to be waiting for somebody to like eat it in a, a car crash. Get a nice 23 year old pancreas. Mm, that's tasty. Mm. You know what? <laughs> but I, I, you know, it's like, it's relative. Like I'm, you know, for me now, a 50 year old. That's a cop out. That yeah. answer's a cop out. That's no. all relative. But if you're 90, are you wearing loafers and no socks? Why would you say that's relative? <laughs> that annoys me. I hate Canada now. You know, I was gonna tour there. I'm now canceling it. I think I think you Two took words, all the Bruce, money from all Bruce, the people. Bella. You took all the money for all the shows that you could do in Canada, and now you're back in the states. Just just counting it, making it. Really count what, what, whatever I was left with. That wicked queen that runs your fucking country came by. You know, just took all my little pieces of gold. Oh I walked God. by with like a couple of dollars that were like, I think they were painted pink. They were pink and green, <laughs> just like your politics. Um. <laughs> uh, for you just tuning in, uh, Bill and Bruce actually are friends. They're just playing. Yeah, dude. I, I haven't seen, I'm, what, what, we live in the same city. I Can live in Toronto. Just say, Bill, I, live- I don't like you like no. that. No, we've gone through a sadness. We've gone through a professional sadness. We would have just been, I can hang out with you now, but we would just stare at each other. Why do you think the show didn't go? And then we let talk about something and then we go, so why do you think the show didn't go? Yeah, and you know what that did? That gave us an opportunity to, to hang out with our families. Yes. Yeah. They're saying, why didn't the show go? <laughs> but dad, I just want to play catch. I can't right now, son. <laughs> I'm still feeling bad about that failed pilot. I'm doing something called processing. What is that? I like to think they look back and be like, we had him. We had had Bruce McCullough, Kevin Hart, and balding Bill Burr. (laughs) We had it. We had it all right in the palm of our fucking hand. And we let it slip through our fingers and open the door for Netflix. That's what I think. I think that whoever's left over there. Oh no, that, what that is, person what is the turning point. That in person Viacom property is saying no to Bruce McCullough. To Kevin to knapsack full of money. Is this an ATC? Co- yes, it is. Thank you for asking. All things comedy, wonderful network. Nice. That's uh for you who don't know, that's Bill Burr's company that encompasses uh what they basically do is they find young stand-ups. They make them open for Bill and they say, no, no, it doesn't pay. It pays an experience. In fact, you should be paying us. And it's like, it pays an exposure. And then there's a table. It's like, no, 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 that's Bill's food. You know what's breaking my heart right now? Aside Mm -hmm. from the fact that you just refuse to hang out with me because I don't have enough (laughs) credits on my IMDb page, (laughs) is comedians now, young comedians are letting agents take a percentage of their advertising. It's the most insane thing ever. It's like they can't do anything. They're just going to sit there and promise them, oh, we're going to get you all this fucking money. And then they're not going to get you the money. And then they have their fucking legal foot in the door. So for the rest of time, you're going to have to pay some fucking agent 
And and they, you create the whole show. You get your listeners. You fucking do everything. This isn't like at an acting gig. It's it just yeah. The, the way performers are like fucking institutionalized, and they just keep running back to the fucking penitentiary. Just it drives me up the wall. Well, and you know, it's actors are so horribly treated. They get paid so little. You know, if you're if luck like I don't audition for things, but it, I usually hire people. It's like you get two thousand you know, submissions for every role. They treat you poorly. They make you wait on set. Like, it's terrible. It's terrible. So I know being a comedian is hard going out and- I like, can't tell if you're making fun of what I just said. No, I I agree with it. And I think, but here's what it is, Bill. And I, I tried to teach you this the first time we worked together. I'm just trying to have to, you know, people just not be fucking paying people they don't need to be paying. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying being an actor isn't a fun job. I'm just, you know. I, I don't know if it is a fun job. I think- the money people hey, right now it's funnier than being in the fucking edit room and having to put the whole damn thing together. I could tell you that just doing your little fucking soliloquy and walking off, <laughs> going down the street with Kevin Hart and hanging out. That's the fucking way to do this business. <laughs> Sitting there with the headphones on going, did we get it? Did we get it? And then fucking a year later. Still oh. sitting there, oh, no, trying I to know. find the right music for the guy when the guy fucking slips on the banana peel. That's not something that that's not. No, fun. no, it's the freaky world of sound, <laughs> which is like all, all these. Mostly, there's there's women now, but mostly men just losing years of their lives moving the sound of a door up one frame. Was oh, that too wet? That sound. Just does that, spending... does that sound like a wooden door to you? That sounds a little metal. Could you play it a few really? more times and confuse really? me? Do you think that they're going to figure that out on the internet because they have nothing better to do, that that was a metal door slamming instead of a wooden door? Um, all right. Bruce, I mean, I guess if this is the way our friendship has to be now, I have to wait for you to do off-Broadway to see your beautiful face. Well, maybe what I'll do is play gigantic uh, arenas like you and, you know... But I can't. I'm just playing a little nice little theater, because I'm I'm no, I'm actually you're of the an people. artist. Because you're I'm an of artist. the people, Bill. I like <laughs> to I like to see their faces when I perform. You never. You're you know what it is, Bruce. If that connection's not there, then what's all that money for, man? Right? Yeah. I is like it. You're, you're still punk rock. <laughs> Even you sit there in your little your little sweater. My little sweater. Yeah. Oh, I don't Whatever. Have my scarf on. I don't have my scarf. I like on. it. Yeah. Thanks. Were you protecting your instrument? I am. You are. All right. I love you, Bruce. You're the best. And I would I love, love to hang out with you. Yes. Okay. I will find I know you you're 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 in the Broadway club and it's not good for your 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 brand to be seen with me. But you know, we'll hang we'll hang way out in like the Inland Empire. So no, 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 no I'll, I'll get I'll get a second key to my room and I'll just put it in your hand. Oh, I and like then, that. then you come back to my hotel and we'll have a drink. But you it's, don't drink anymore, so we'll you'll have some. You know, just a couple of fellas having a drink in a hotel room, right? <laughs> Nothing untoward about that. <laughs> a robe slips open. That's the it's the oops. It's the wind. You but know, that, you're just helping happens. me out. You were trying to put it back. That's all that happened. <laughs> it's not gay. And I, and I put yours back. Not, it was, it was a normal all. thing. No. Yeah. And I don't fight you back because we're friends. <laughs> right? If you're a stranger. Yeah. I said, hey, what are you doing? But it's it's Bruce, so I know that what you're doing. It's not sexual. Yeah, and a few maybe months or years later, you go, oh, hey, that was a bit weird. That was a bit weird. Want to revisit it? <laughs> Just so we can confirm that it was weird? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bruce McCullough, Tales of Bravery and Stupidity. Now that we got that whole background with you getting into a knife fight wearing a pink shirt, I mean, come on. Uh, October 14th through the 29th at the Soho Playhouse Live off Broadway show, the legendary, the wonderful, the empathetic Bruce McCullough, everybody. I love you, brother. I hope to I see you at some point. But when you're done with your run and your adulation and your Tony, do they have an off Broadway Tony? Is it called uh, an Anthony? <laughs> I don't know. They they probably do, but I I will. Hey, be I want one. a little Anthony down there in fucking <laughs> Soho. Gave it's me two babe. fucking. <laughs> Well, if it makes you feel better, I, I'm always on the 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 internet version of whatever uh, award show it is. They the asked me if I wanted, they asked me if I wanted to present at the Grammys, and I was so fucking excited. I thought I was on the Grammys, and I went. I bought like a three thousand dollar fucking suit, two thousand dollar suit, Tom Ford, and I fucking show up. I'm in the valley on the internet. 
introducing the best Latino bands, and they didn't tell me how to pronounce anybody's name, and they mispronounced everything. <laughs> and then all of these fucking white people, you know, who, who go to Taco Tuesday got all fucking upset for Latino people. Um, mm -hmm. Well, maybe you should ask that agent that you give all that money to that, to ask more questions next time you get a booking. You know, I don't like being confrontational. <laughs> this is all just an act. I, I understand. I'm wearing slippers right now. That's how, I know how sweet that's you how are. That's how beta I am. I know. Yeah. You know. All right. Well, listen, I pray for you in the Ukraine. Th thank right? you, sir. And the dolphins and um, people that want to see, you know, their face drawn on a bathroom room door so they can be like, yes, I feel identified. Now I can go shit in there and have a go in the ocean. <laughs> um, good luck with you and, and, and all the best for you and your act. <laughs> I like this. This is this is like Hallmark heckling. It's like it's a person, right? Your act. Yeah, I right. like give, it. Give my best to your act. Okay. <laughs> All right, you win. You win, Bruce McCullough. Everybody, thank you so much, and uh, uh, break a leg uh, on your wonderful run there from October 14th through the 29th. I will be looking for a text message on October 30th saying, "Bill, I'm returning." And I would love to spend Halloween with you playing Thank dress you. Up in a total heterosexual way. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. All right. That's it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for listening. Bruce McCullough. Hey, what's going on? It's Bill Burr and it's the Monday Morning Podcast for Monday, October 13th, 2014. How's it going? How are you? What's going on? Is everything good with you? Is everything good with you? Well, yeah, you look good. Yeah, I haven't seen you for a while. What else is going on? Oh, yeah? Oh, that's good. Me? Nah, nothing. You know, same old shit. My fucking boss, you know, he's breaking my balls. Well, I'm not going to bore you with it, dude. What do you think about the Pats? Are they for fucking real? It's like, you know, which team are they? Um, I'm actually doing this out in my living room. That's why I have the Echo out here. Um, you know, like the old Capitol Records thing that they used to do, right? Chances are because I wear a silly Um, We got the construction workers downstairs. So if you hear some fucking banging around or whatever, that's just them finishing it up, finishing up the goddamn job. I always wonder what they think when I'm up here fucking singing and screaming and saying cunt. You know, they probably think I'm yelling at my wife or bitching about the job they're doing, you know? Maybe if they didn't have real jobs, they'd have time to listen to the podcast like you, like you are right now. How dare you in the middle of a fucking work week in the United States of America, you're just sitting here listening to this shit. You know, aren't we slipping enough? Or whatever the fuck you are around the world. Do you know this weekend I went out and I did a, I did a show at the Spotlight 29 Casino with uh, Let There Be Talks, uh, Dean Del Rey of the Let There Be Talk podcast and uh, Joe Bartnick, Rose Bowl legend and host of the uh, Puck Off um, podcast. And um, are the peas popping? I got to turn this fucking volume down here. Um, anyways, the um, we went out there. We, we had a great time, but we were on our way out there. And um, we we're on the highway. And I'm thinking, all right, there's fucking... Three of us here, we can use the uh, the carpool lane. And recently, I've been getting these tickets for riding, I don't know what, going through tolls and not paying. And I'm like, where the hell was that? And there's pictures of my car and shit, and I'm on the highway. I had no idea what it was. And um, I was riding out with those guys, and they finally explained what it was. <coughs> they said um, that a private group bought up a section of the of the highway out here in Los Angeles and um they own it and when you use it you you got to pay them money you got to give them toll money and all that type of shit and uh that was really scary to me because if they were going to do that why wouldn't the state just do it why wouldn't they just say well fuck it we'll just do it and we'll collect that money god knows we could use it Right. But instead, they sold it off to somebody. So what that says to me is this state is so fucking bankrupt. They don't even have time to just, you know, just collect money on roads that they already own. They have to sell off like a giant section of a highway. 
Who's that group that owns the giant section of the highway? And how the fuck do I get involved in that 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 business? I'll parachute right out of here. I'll, I'll never. I'll do like fucking a podcast seven days a goddamn week. I'll never go on the road again. Won't tell any jokes. And you guys can just listen to me slowly slip into madness. Do you realize how fucking that's one of the greatest investments of all time? I own a strip of like I own five miles of a fucking highway outside one of the most populated cities ever where there's no public transportation for the most part. Everybody's in a car. And every time they go up through that fucking thing, ding, 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 ding. 45 cents, 45 cents, 45 cents, 45 cents. And I'm sitting here on my fucking couch. Just sitting here. A bag of pretzels and a fucking Miller High Life. Right? Just sitting here. 45 cents, 45 cents, 45 cents, 45 cents. It's the greatest fucking thing ever. Oh, and I know what you think. Oh, dude, what about the overhead? What about it? It's already fucking made. When do you have to pave it? Once every four or five years? If that I remember back in the day, the Mass Pike, the whole time I was there, they, they paved that thing one time. I don't know what it is. What, whatever, man. Who gives a f- How much could that fuck? Well, shit, that could cost a lot of money. Wait a minute. I know if you do any sort of driveway, they always come in. Oh, it's going to be about 20 grand. Is it? All right, more like three. Um, that, that could get expensive. I guess that could get expensive. But, dude, I'm telling you, that is the move. If you can somehow get in with the people that are going to start buying up the fucking roads over here. and Oh, Jesus Christ. I would be such an obnoxious ass if I was making money like that. I'd start wearing wife beaters and I'd have a fucking gold piece hanging around my neck that just said 45 cents. <laughs> 45 cents, 45 cents, 45 cents. Right? I'd slowly just go fucking nuts thinking about it. Being like that guy, pick up the papers, pick up the papers. Hey, Bill, what do you want for lunch? Uh, let me get a roast beef sandwich. 45 cents, 45 cents. Yeah, don't, yeah he, he's a little weird. He's a little weird, but don't worry, dude. He's fucking paying for the whole lunch. You know, he, uh, he just kind of repeats himself a little bit. Um, so whoever did that, uh, good on you. And um, whoever... Um, has been in office out here in California. Uh, fuck you, you spineless cunt. All of you. How the fuck do you go bankrupt as a goddamn state? Everybody going to work every day. You want to talk about 45 cents, 45 cents. These motherfuckers are getting money from everybody. You're getting free money. Free money. Taxes, free money. Hey, I'm going to go buy a fucking chapo. Put it on my big, stupid, round head. All right, that'll be $8 plus fucking, you know, whatever. 80 cents tax. There you go. You didn't have to do a fucking thing, state government, did you? All you had to do is sit around and wait for me to go out and go buy a fucking hat. Free money. Here you go. Here you go. Here you go. Coming in. Big pile of fucking loot. And then you blow all of it. How do you go bankrupt as a state? Jesus fucking Christ. Unbelievable. I don't even want to hear your fucking excuses. Well, you know, picture that little stretch of five-mile hotel. I mean, a uh, whole, uh, um, of highway. I mean, you got fucking, the highway goes, you know, from San Diego all the way up. I'll go fuck yourself. You know what's in there? Around all those highways? A zillion fucking people. All giving you money. Every time they go out to go buy themselves, you know, some condoms and a pair of socks. You're fucking making money. You got plenty of goddamn money, but this is what happens. All right? The fucking public servants, the people who hold office, they don't make any money. They make no fucking money. I don't know what a senator makes. I know the president makes 400 grand a fucking year, okay? So if you're governor of Los Angeles, what are you taking down a year? What, a hundred grand? Hundred grand to have everybody in the fucking city say that you're a piece of shit, you're fucking everything up, right? You got to have security so nobody comes up and fucking shanks you every time you go out to go get a club sandwich. And not to mention it costs millions and millions and millions of dollars to campaign to get that fucking job. And in the end, all you get is a hundred grand. Those guys, they are set up to be bribed. I, this is, I 100% believe this shit. So basically... 
You're going for a job that's going to get you a hundred grand and you need millions and millions of dollars to fucking get the thing. So now you got to get in bed with all these fat cats that can fucking buy up the goddamn highways. And that's what they do, right? Tell you what, I'll finance your fuck. Listen to me. Hey, fucking shut up. I'm going to fucking, what do you need? What do you, how, how much money do you need for this? Huh? Eight, seven, nine million. What the fuck do you need? All right. Hey, 20, 40, 60, yeah, you fucking keep it. All right. But. All right. I you in return, you got to give me you got to give me 10 miles of the fucking 10 or the five. Let me get the five. All the fucking hippies driving up to San Francisco. Let me get 10, 10 miles of that. I'm not finished. Let me get 10 miles of that. And uh, let's make uh, let's make it a no fly zone over uh, Disneyland, whatever the fuck they want. Right. Then that's what happens or whatever. You know what? I'm going to do this job. I'm going to repay. I'm going to be the guy who fucking repaves it. I'm going to donate $2 million to your fucking campaign so you can get this job that makes hundred grand a fucking year and maybe eventually get to the White House so you get that Marilyn Monroe side pussy and then you get to go on the fucking golden parachute million dollar a speech fucking gig after you retire. And in the meantime, um, I want the contract to do this job for the state and I'm going to charge you fucking $9 million for a hammer as the old fucking urban legend goes and that's how you go fucking bankrupt there you go look at that dummy like me that's my theory um anyways this is the monday morning podcast as i mentioned um that was a good 10 minutes of horseshit horse spelt w is it horseshit like you fucking whoa or is it horseshit and you just say them so fast it's whore you know what i'm gonna google that right now let me see let me look up horseshit h-o-r-e S-H-I-T. You know, if you curse as much as I do, you should really find dictionary whore shit. It is a word. Shit whore. Shit bitch whore fish. Whore face. Look at this. She used to whore shit. Not embarrassed at all. She's used to whore shit. Or is it horse shit? I think we can all agree it's definitely bullshit, right? Wait a minute. Girls... On IRC, this is Urban Dictionary, girls on IRC, which I don't know what that is, who are desperate for attention and will latch onto any scum they find. Also gets naked on cam for attention and sends out pics of themselves committing ODD acts to their anus. Jesus Christ, what's funny about the fucking Urban Dictionary? Just like the Webster in the dictionary, you got to look up like another five fucking words. ODD. I remember ODB. That was old dirty bastard. Old dirty dick. What? Um, sends out pics themselves committing to ODD acts. I feel like the white cop on Sanford and Son right now. What's going off? Um, also, ODD. What the fuck would that be? Other dudes dicks. Out pictures of themselves committing other dudes dicks acts to that doesn't make sense. Ah, Jesus Christ. Now i got to look this up. See what happens? This is how you lose a whole fucking day. This is why nothing is getting done in this country, because you fucking go to the Urban Dictionary as a white guy like me. Oppositional Defiant Disorder. Now, what the... F oh, Jesus Christ. You know what? I don't even give a fuck anymore. Oh, my God. He has ODD. Force him... Force drug him. It can't have anything to do with ridiculous excessive punishment and restrictions. Operational defiant disorder. Surprisingly, it's real. A fake ass dis disorder pulled out of their asses of a small collective of psychiatrists working for pharmaceutical companies in order to maximize revenue. Of course, there's no... Uh, you, know, you know what's funny? I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore. All right, I'll chalk that up to be white as fuck. Um, anyways... Plowing ahead here. Um, do you guys? Ba 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 ba. Did you guys watch any of the football this week? Of course you did. Of course you did. You had nothing better to do, just like me. You like how I'm doing that? I'm dragging you into my own fucking world. Um, I actually didn't watch too much of it. I was running around like a maniac. Um, I did watch my Patriots. Um, don't let the final score fool you. It was a lot closer than you thought it was. I mean, we were only up by eight with four minutes to go against the Buffalo Bills. 
This is why I can't I can't buy into the Patriots team yet. People are like, oh yeah, you know, they beat the Bengals. You know, we had a close game against the Raiders. The Raiders, right? They've stunk. I don't. They've, they've stunk. I don't. They've stunk since they were they were in L.A. Who's kidding who? No, that's not true. They had the uh, the snow cone game where they lost to us because of an obscure rule. I love how Raider fans think that that game was bullshit. It wasn't bullshit. The rule was bullshit. But the call was not bullshit. It was right on the money. What was bullshit was the roughing the passer call against Sugar Bear Hamilton that got the Raiders into Super Bowl XI. All right? So quit your crying. Go put on your makeup and your stupid fucking costume and go sit in the end zone and think that you're intimidating somebody. Oh, you might intimidate me. I'm in the stands. No one gives a shit about me, but you're not going to intimidate a professional football player with your goddamn outfit. When I look into when I when I bite into a York peppermint patty, when I look into the fucking end zone of the goddamn Raiders, right, and I see the sadness that 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 fan base has become, I'll never get over because I, I fucking love the Raiders. I, that is one of the most. That is arguably the best logo. In all the national football, the, everybody, who the fuck hasn't tried to rip off putting some sort of black into their uniform to try to be more intimidating, or at least the amount of people who have, right? Atlanta Falcons, the old Houston Oilers, didn't they do that? Or Jerry Glanville just went out and got a black jacket? That fucking idiot, he shouldn't have been a head coach, he should have been on like Falcon Crest, um, or the Dukes of Hazards, or something like that. Who else? Everybody for a while, I can't remember, everybody would always switch their uniforms to black because they want to be more fucking intimidating when the Raiders were smart enough from day one, right? The silver and black, and they had a fucking pirate on the side of their helmet. They've never had to change it. Look, at look, every fucking team out there had to change it. Had to eventually was like, all right, you know, what the fuck were we thinking in 1960 or 19-whatever? Everybody has fucked with their goddamn lo- logo. Except for the Raiders. They never had to. They got it right, right out of the gate. Like that fat fuck they pull out of the stands to try to hit a half-court fucking shot, right? So he can go out and go win a fucking Dodge Opal or whatever the fuck they're giving away. Oh, my God, I can't even afford the insurance. Right? Some meaty, fat, tit fucking moron goes out there. Nothing but net. That's what they did back in 1960. And sure, there's other teams that couldn't admit that they fucked up, like the Dolphins. When you really think about the Dolphins, that is probably the worst fucking name, considering the Sharks was still on, that was still available. They could have been the Sharks. They could have had some badass fucking logo. I mean, if you're going to go with some sort of porpoise type looking fish, right? What do they do? They, they pick the Dolphins. Why don't you just call yourselves the Pussies? Right? That logo should have had a fucking beach ball right on the end of its goddamn nose. So anyways, they st- but they stick with this thing for so goddamn long. They win two Super Bowls. They go undefeated back when you played like fucking 12 games and nobody gave a shit. There was no pressure whatsoever. Right? They went to another two Super Bowls, I think, yeah, in the 80s. One with Don Strzok and one with uh, Dan Marino. And after a while, you just kind of you just kind of forgot that they were the Dolphins and they had that silly ass logo, and it, it never dawned on me again how stupid that fucking name and logo was until they changed it. They changed it what last year? I think they changed it last year. I think I already made fun of the logo, but whenever I look at that logo, that logo to me looks like it's the logo of a corporation that just had a massive fucking oil spill in the Gulf. And now they're trying to pretend like they give a shit about the environment. So they switch up their logo, you know, kind of like BP did. They put like that fucking looks like corn and grass is the color of their logo. Like, oh, wow, they care about us. They care about the trees. Um, They don't. Um, All right. How far into this fucking podcast are we at this point? 18 minutes, another fucking nine minutes of bullshit. There we go. Well, it's time for a little bit of advertising, all right? Here we go, everybody. Me undies. Me undies. Me undies. Cupping my fucking balls. Boop, boop, boop. Me undies. 
me undies, my dick and balls, that's all. Not riding up my fucking crack. All right, it's unbelievable how putting on a great pair of underwear changes your entire outlook for the day. That is not a joke. Feeling that velvety smooth material <laughs> up against your privates. You know that feeling of putting on that ratty old saggy underwear? Oh my God, dude, we got it. I want you to know the feeling of wearing great fitting, great looking underwear like Jim fucking Palmer. You need to know more about MeUndies.com. MeUndies has the most comfortable underwear you have ever tried on. They fit perfectly. They don't ride up on you. Of course, they fit perfectly. There's not that much material. It's not like you're making pants. What do you got to measure the inseam of somebody's fucking taint? Um, actually, I've heard these are great, by the way. Um, they fit perfectly. They don't ride up on you. And they literally pull moisture away from your scrubs. From your skin. So you're cool all day long. That doesn't make any sense. You, you sweat to cool yourself off. Now you're pull, pulling the moisture away. Why don't you just come out and say it, MeUndies? You're not going to have sweaty balls as long as you wear our stuff. MeUndies, MeUndies, no more sweaty balls. But, but, but here's the thing. They also make you look great. What does that mean? Do they frame your package like a strike that hits the fucking corner? Um, go to MeUndies.com and check out pictures of all different styles of underwear. And for girls, check out those hot-looking boy shorts. Men and women, high-quality materials for your high-quality ma materials. Oh, I get it. Uh, if you know what I mean. Sorry, I totally blew that. High-quality materials for your high-quality materials, if you know what I mean. The price, glad you asked, a fraction of what typically high-end designers charge. Who the hell buys designer underwear? It's like having designer fucking piping in your walls. Oh, my God. Is that your initials on the pipes I can't see? Here, I'll help you out. Go to MeUndies.com slash Burr, B-U-R-R. Get 20% off your first order. 20% off your order when you go to MeUndies.com slash Burr. And right now, you'll even get shipping. You'll get free shipping in the United States and Canada. So basically, if you live in North America, north of Mexico, in Central America. Oh, she's a hammering down there. North of all Central America, for some reason, you know, Central America, they're not focusing on. You'd think that that's where the most sweaty balls are going to be at, right? Isn't this a sketch on fucking SNL, my sweaty balls? Um, basically, the United States and Canada. The highest concentration of white people with sweaty balls are in the North American area. And for years, we have walked around with a devastating condition of hot balls well thank god since meundies came on the list came on the scene all right you get it people all right DraftKings, everyone Lis listeners are winning huge cash prize every week let me start over again draft King oh jesus what in god's name could they be doing down there i think they're putting in the fucking floors all right DraftKings, everyone listen listeners are winning huge cash prizes every week at draftkings.com america's favorite one-week fantasy football site one week fantasy means no season long commitments. Play whenever you want. Got an injured player? Not a problem at DraftKings, where it's like a new season every week. So you're never stuck with the same players. Pick your team in minutes, and you could be on your way to winning instant cash. Last year, one player turned 11 bucks into four grand, and another won 100 grand for his first time ever playing. And another player won a million bucks in one day just playing fantasy football. Hurry and get a free and get free entry into the one hundred thousand dollar fantasy football contest this weekend, where first place takes home ten thousand dollars. Call to action. This is when I'm supposed to get really intense. Head over to DraftKings.com now and enter the promo code Defense to play for free. DraftKings.com. Bigger events, bigger winnings, bigger millionaires. Enter Defense for every entry now at DraftKings.com. DraftKings.com. That once again is DraftKings.com because of that man right there, Arethinal James Simpson. Um. All right, there you go. I think that's fucking hilarious. There's a couple of things that are really. When you watch like an NFL football game, did you have you like watched the advertising? Like how much of a fucking like psycho loser they think you are? 
First of all, they're running that fucking, that ad every 10 minutes, don't hit women. No more. No more, she slipped on the coffee cake. No more. I I was stretching and accidentally pushed her down the stairs. No more. No more, uh, we were playing football and she tried to block a kick. She tried to block the, uh, the punt. Dude, she was roughing me. She's not supposed to run into the kick. It ain't fault of my fault. My fucking sneaker hit her face, you know? Um, so they got that going. So basically, wife, they think we're wife beaters. All right? Every five seconds, you got some sort of, you know, your dick doesn't get hard and you're going bald. You're a balding, limp dick wife beater. Right? And then they run the, the fucking DraftKings. You're a degenerate gambler. You're a degenerate gambling, bald, limp dick, fucking wife beater. Nothing positive. That fucking no more commercial fucking annoys me because I feel like they're yelling at me and I don't hit women. So why don't you fucking tone it down a little bit? Okay. I actually tweeted this out. You know, when you watch a WNBA game, do they start yelling at all the broads watching that shit? You know, no more marrying a guy just because he's got money but you don't love them. No more, I'm used to a certain lifestyle. Do they do that shit? Of course they don't. If you consider, I don't know, something fucking wrong with it. That whole No More campaign, and everybody's dressed all in black, you know, they think on the cover of the fucking Beatles album. You know, my favorite part of all of it, can somebody please explain to me how they didn't do a, like, didn't do any sort of background check on Ice-T and he got in that fucking commercial? According to his albums, wasn't he a pimp at some point? I don't know. I don't know much about the pimp game, but as far as I know, you know, if you started off as a pimp, you probably made your first million smacking bitches every couple of seconds. Huh? Bitch, where's my money? <laughs> oh, I love Ice-T. Every time you fucking see that guy, he's always talking about the street. You know, yo, I could make I could make five grand in 20 minutes every fucking time. I don't give a fuck what you bring up. Ice-T is going to bring up the street and how much money he could make, how quickly. Hey, Ice-T, isn't it a beautiful day out here? I'll tell you what's beautiful. When I was out on the street, I could make five grand in 20 minutes. Yeah, I was just kind of talking about the weather. (laughs) Every fucking one of those vh1 things from 10 years ago all those behind the musics anything blah 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 well, i don't give a fuck what they were talking about ice t eventually came on and told you that he could make five grand in 20 minutes when i was out on the street the pimping game see the pimping game oh shut up about the fucking pimping game i hate how that thing, whole thing is romanticized see when you get some runaway to go out and sell her pussy for money there's an art to it is it you fucking creep you know what's funny? I don't even know. Was he, a, was he a pimp? All those albums fucking ran together. They all came out. They were so fucking overwhelming when I first heard them. You know, I'm sitting here, a little white boy living in the cul-de-sac, and all of a sudden, Easy e and all these guys came out. I, I couldn't keep up with who was getting shot, who was getting smacked. So I might be wrong on that one, but am I the only one who was like, wait a minute. That's that guy who can make five grand in 20 minutes, smacking bitches out there and selling crack, Right. No more. <laughs> ah, Jesus, I don't even know what the fuck I'm talking about. Anyways, let's get down to the, the football this week. So I watched the Patriots. Obviously, it was a big victory on the AFC East. The weak, limp dicked fucking AFC East. Jesus Christ, man, what has happened to the fucking Jets? But Benny and the Jets, they're fucking falling off the face of the earth. Now, what a lot of people would think, that the Patriots are going to have an easy victory. Come this Thursday, a Thursday night football. And I'm here to tell you that probably won't happen. I'm actually not buying it. Because, uh, I don't know, Jets always play as tough. All right? I'm going to sell you a bad game. The Patriots versus the Jets, Thursday night football. All right. You know, I'll tell you, the Jets, they, uh, they got their backs up against the wall. You know, I, I wouldn't count out this Rex Ryan team. They're still bought into a system. I know they've lost nine games in a fucking row. Um, they're actually in a uh, – it was actually a rough, uh, a rough week uh, for um, New York football, huh? 
Giants got the shit kicked out of me. The Eagles really that fucking good? I mean, I, just, I don't know. I just kept thinking, you know, all right, the Giants are going to make some sort of halftime adjustment at some point, right? It was brutal, though, huh? Cruz got fucking that brutal injury. Oh, look at this shit here. I'm on the on New York Post. Hard to believe radio host's excuse for mocking Cruz injury. A Philadelphia radio host added insult to injury Sunday night, mocking giant star receivers Victor Cruz after he injured his right knee in the second half loss. How is it hard to believe that anybody in Philly does anything other than, I guess if they act like human beings, then it's actually hard to believe. Uh, Cruz, who had just dropped a fourth down pass in the end zone, tore his patellar tendon, ow, on the play and immediately grabbed his knee. Mike Missinelli, hey, Mike fucking Missinelli, a radio host for 97.5 The Fanatic, made fun of Cruz's salsa dancing as he writhed in pain. I got to admit, that's kind of funny. Hey, Giant fans, Rick's, Victor Cruz is over. Dance to that. Oh, God. Okay, wait a minute. I thought he was going to be like, ba, 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 ba. ow, I thought he was going to do something like that. That, that would have made me laugh. As Cruz was carted off in tears, the fans in attendance at Lincoln Financial Field gave him a sincere round of applause. Oh, look at that. See, look at me. I'm saying all Eagle fans are bad. I guess they're not. And Miss and I soon backtracked, deta- deleting the tweet and replacing it with multiple apologies. <laughs> oh, somebody was home drunk watching the game. Hey, Giant fans, Cruz is done. Dance to that tweet. Just sitting there laughing. That's a good one. That'll get me some more listeners. And all of a sudden, all the hate starts coming in. He starts sweating all over the place except down on his balls because he's wearing MeUndies. MeUndies, no more sweaty balls. Um, This is what he wrote. He said, I apologize for the Cruz tweet. I didn't see that he got hurt on the play, was outside the stadium, and saw he dropped it walking to my car. You lying sack of shit. He goes, I just saw on big screen outside the stadium that he dropped the pass. Didn't see that he got hurt on, my, on the play. My bad. I would never have tweeted that had I known he got injured. Please know that. Know what? You're full of shit. Victor Cruz is over right there. That means you know he got hurt. Ah, oh, Jesus. You know what? This guy doesn't need me undies. Me undies. No more sweaty balls because he doesn't have any balls. Just say, listen, I was at the game. I got fucking hammered. And I made a joke that a lot of people made. I was actually in a cigar bar last night watching the game and somebody made that joke. Um, and people laughed. It was more like, oh, you know. But, you know, what the fuck? You're going to sit there, wop, bop, 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 boo. Every time you score a touchdown, the joke's just laying there waiting for somebody to say it. Um, <clears throat> he combined that with some alcohol. And you combine that he's in Philly, so he's got to be at least three quarters of a fucking animal. Animal. <laughs> My voice is cracking. Um <clears throat> I actually had a great time. I went to this awesome cigar bar last night, and I watched the uh, Giants-Eagles game. Even though the game was just fucking, it was just was so one-sided. It was just a wire, wire to wire ass-kicking. Um, and we actually were sitting there, and um, Jesus Christ, they're hammering right underneath me. This is what it's been, people, for the last fucking six months. I know what you're thinking. Six months, Jesus, Bill, what are they, rebuilding the hoe downstairs? Yes. Yes, they are. And now they're going to put in the hardwood floors, and then they found out the floor wasn't level. And the guy fucking goes, hey, Bill, uh, was this out downstairs area ever outside? Yeah, it was. Let me guess. Let me guess. It used to be some sort of half-assed porch, so they had it raked, you know, at a nice fucking whatever, 15-degree angle, so the rain water would roll off it. Now it's inside. Whatever. When you're downstairs in my house, you just feel like you're on a boat that's making a left turn or a right turn, depending on which way you walk. And I don't give a fuck. No, it's not that bad. I never even noticed, to be honest with you. But, um, you know, he went down there with a level and that little ball just kind of rolled a little bit to the side. I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck. You know, I give a fuck, but I just I don't have any more money. I don't have any more money to throw at that. Okay, I'm cutting you off. All right, son, it's over. You got to get out in the world and get a fucking job. Um. 
so anyways, uh, went out there with a couple of buddies, smoked a couple of cigars, and uh, was watching the game. It just was just a wire-to-wire fucking beatdown, and um, I don't know. I was disappointed in the game. I was impressed, obviously, with Philly. I know the Giants started off rough. They've been playing better. Uh, but still, I didn't think it was going to go like that. And I've actually, I've always loved the NFC East. It's always just been, uh, it's always been great football, always great rivalries and that type of thing. It sucked that the, the, the Redskins have not been a factor for so long because those Cowboy Redskins games um, were always great when I was growing up. Um, but I guess there's always one team that's going to suck in your division. Somebody's got to come in last. It's just been them for a while um, <clears throat> for whatever reason. Um all right, is that all I had to say in football? I, I honestly didn't watch a lot. Um, I would have to think that they're fucking calling for Rex Ryan's head at this point. Or are they still sticking with him? Are they still sticking with the guy? I'm actually going to be upset if he gets fired because I love watching him lose. You know? And if they fire him, I, I don't get to do that anymore. All right, here we go. And, and uh, What do we got here? Spit it out, Bill. New York Post Sports. All right. Kevin Durant hurt his foot. The Yankees' A-Rod mysteries are much deeper than you think. Ah, oh, A-Rod, my favorite Yankee of all time. The $200 million albatross. Um, let's see. Gronk Swagger returning to the Patriots. Uh, he, he, I guess he made a quote they should get laid. What the fuck? Um, Jets pick six, ending a gambling miracle for Broncos backers. Yeah, I don't see them getting saying get rid of Rex Ryan yet. Well, it's very surprising for the New York Post. They usually got the sky is falling after two fucking days. Um, all right, I got to look at this story here. Sorry, guys. I'm just you just listening to me read the newspaper this week. Gronk swagger to the Patriots. They should get laid. Rob Gronkowski is o- is always looking out for his teammates. Following New England's decisive 37-22 win. I love how it was decisive. We were up by eight with four minutes to go. Somebody didn't watch the game. He just looked at the final score. Um, 37-22 win over the Bills on Sunday. The Patriots tight end wanted to give credit to the often overlooked offensive line. He goes, they're, they're the ones who should, oh, they're the ones who should get laid tonight, Gronkowski said. Ah, that's, that's very nice of him. See, that wasn't bad. That wasn't bad at all. Um, all right, enough with the friggin' football. How about the baseball? How about the baseball? Ba, 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 boo. You guys been watching that shit? I've been watching the uh, the Royals. I haven't watched the Giants. Cardinals. I saw the Cardinals had a walk off last night, which is awesome. Um, but hang on a second. Where the fuck did that story go? God damn it! The New York Post actually had a fucking great story about some nurse. Because I don't want to have this all be sports and listen to you guys fucking whining at me. Um, how much did you do for the people who don't like sports? All right, nurse. Here's one for you. For people who aren't into sports, nurse accused of killing 38 patients she found annoying. Cops arrested a nurse in northeast Italy. Hey, how you doing? In connection with deaths of as many as 38 patients who she say she, whom she may have killed because she found them or their relatives annoying. Wow. Daniela Poggiali, a 42-year-old resident from the town of Lugo, was taken into custody over the weekend and booked for allegedly slaying a, a, the alleged slaying of a 78-year-old patient, Rosa Calderoni, who died from an injection of potassium. Calderoni had been admitted to the hospital with a routine illness before she died unexpectedly. Tests show she died with a high amount of potassium, which can provo- provoke cardiac arrest in her bloodstream, according to Central European News. Her death triggered an investigation which found that 38 others had died mysteriously while Poggiali was on duty, the news agency reported. One of Poggiali's fellow nurses described her as a cold person but always eager to work. Wow. Another one of Pogali's colleagues said that the accused nurse was once reported for giving powerful laxative to patients at the end of her shift to make work tougher for the, the nurses working after her. 
filed under crime, comma, Italy. Jesus Christ. Now, there's a person who never got hugged as a child, huh? What a fucking... So, I mean, I shouldn't say that, man. You know, because she hasn't been convicted of anything. Why did? Why do they do that? Why do they protect the alleged victim but not the alleged accused? I saw something last night that was saying that this, this person out here attacked a 68-year-old woman with like a broomstick or something outside of a fucking ATM. And... So then they show this guy's face, right? And they just, just random fucking name. They're like, yeah, they show the guy's face on TV, his mugshot, and they go, uh, and that is when Scott Walker allegedly took a broomstick and smashed a 68-year-old woman over the head with it at an ATM. It's like, allegedly. You don't even know if you got the right fucking guy. This guy's face is all over the fucking news. Why did, why did we have to see somebody's face before they're convicted? I don't understand that. Like, you know, how do you fucking make a comeback from that? Hey, aren't you the guy who alleged, who got acu- accused fucking, <laughs> I, what is the word, accused assaulter of a 68-year-old woman? Like, how do you get a fucking job after that? Um, anyways, with the amount of times that they get the wrong person, don't you think that they should maybe hold off on showing the photo? Anybody, Bueller, anybody, anybody at all. Does anybody give a shit on any level whatsoever? Where the hell's the recorder? Don't even tell me. Don't even tell me I knocked it off. Ah, fuck. Okay, good. I thought for half a second I shut it off. I'm actually late today because old Billy Boy's got a day job. Old Billy Boy's got a day job right in a fucking show that I can't wait for you guys to see, but I'm not allowed to talk about it. Until they announce it. Once they announce it, I'll give you a little bit of hype on it. I think you're going to enjoy it. That's all I can fucking say. Um, Hey, I want to thank everybody who came out to the uh, Spotlight 29 Casino to see uh, Dean Del Rey, Joe Bartnick, and myself. We had a uh, a wonderful time out there. Um, I got to do more stand-up, though, man. I really miss doing it. I've been writing this fucking show and kind of burning it at both ends. So uh, I got to figure that out. But I'm I'm basically straight out writing this thing until uh, Thanksgiving. And then my schedule eases up a little bit more. I do have coming up. I got some great gigs coming up. I'm doing the 20th anniversary of Comics Come Home. The great thing that uh, the great benefit foundation, whatever the hell you call it, that Dennis Leary and Cam Neely um, started 20 years ago for the Cam Neely um, house, which basically when... Um, Unfortunately, I think Cam lost both of his parents. I know at least one of his parents, he lost to cancer. And, uh, you know, they were in, like, the hospital and that type of thing. So they've made up the Cam Neely house. And so it's just a place, like, during treatment where people can, rather than sitting in a hospital, can actually feel at home. It's a great thing. And it's 20 years. I can't believe that because I did either Comics Come Home 2 or 3 way back in 1996. So I don't know... If they were 94, 95, 96, that was number three. If this is the 20th one, is this the 20th, 20 years or the 20th one? You know what I mean? Like he played 19 years, 20 seasons. Like I can't figure it out, but whatever. This is either the 20th or the 20th year that they've been doing it. And um, I'm going to be up there and it's going to be an absolute murderer's row of uh, stand-up comedians on that thing. And... uh, one of them who I can't wait to see is going to be Stephen Wright, who is arguably one of the best comedians I've ever seen. I mean, he is. There's no argument there. He just is. I can't wait to see him. And uh, it's going to be awesome. So I got that going on. And then the next day, um, I'm going to be at Giggles Comedy Club in Saugus, Saugus, on like November 9th, doing a benefit up there. And then the following week, I'm out in Florida. And on what is that? I don't know what the fucking date is. Why don't I, why don't I look here? Hamana, Hamana, Hamana. Um, in November, I'm basically, I'm going out for Thursday night football when the, uh, the dolphins play the bills. And, uh, I'm going to the Thursday night game. And then the next night I am in, uh, can you tell I'm trying to open windows? That's why I'm fucking talking slower. I'm in, uh, the, I'm at the West Palm beach improv in West Palm beach, Florida. 
and uh, doing a couple shows there. Uh, me, Paul Verzi. And, uh, and then the next day, I'm going to the Miami Hurricane Florida Seminole game. Unfortunately, it's where the Miami Hurricanes play, so I don't have to listen too much of that. Fortunately, I won't have to do that. The amount of people who do that and actually think that that's, you know, like Native Americans actually used to do that. Like that's actually one of their songs rather than it was just some horse shit that Hollywood made up. That and going, woo, all that bullshit. <laughs> you know what's so fucking crazy is how that stuck around for this goddamn long. The people came up with that shit. Do you understand that they came up with that shit when people didn't even know how to act yet? At least on film or whatever like that. That was like 30 years before. Why I ought to? Let me tell you something, Shay. All of that stupid fucking horrible acting before Marlon Brando came around and changed the game. Um, what's up, Cleo? What are you doing? Come here, buddy. Come here. How you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Hmm? You taking a nap? Yeah, that was rough, wasn't it? Going to the side of the house. Relieving yourself and then eating a whole fucking can of dog food. You must be exhausted. I can really see why you have to go there and take another nap. Huh? What do you do all day? Nothing. Why are you always sleeping? I want an answer. Nothing. Microphone right in her muzzle. I get nothing. All right, get out of here. All right? Okay, go on. Fucking love that dog. Fucking love that dog, man. Um, I will never not have a dog. You know, in fact, you know, this one here, if we got another dog, would probably try to kill it unless it was a baby boy from what I heard. So I, I don't need that drama in my house. My dog's a psycho because somebody beat the shit out of it before I got it. Um, so I'm going to keep this dog, you know, and uh, hopefully, God willing, how old is she? Five, six years. I don't want to think about this. However long she lasts. And uh, but th then the next round, I'm getting two. I'm gonna get a blue nose and a red nose. Uh, pity. A couple of puppies. And uh, that's it. I'm always gonna have fucking dogs. They just make your life better. They really do. So, anyways, hey, listen to this. Oh, Billy fucking booze bag is uh, is seven days sober. Eight days. I haven't drank in eight days. It's fucking great. Now I'm ready to go on a fucking run. That's all it takes. Those of you guys trying to knock off the booze, unless you're like a serious fucking alcoholic, which fortunately I don't suffer from that. Um, it takes like f five days for me is the tipping point. If I'm like three, four days in, I'm like, yeah, this doesn't seem like a streak. You know, like, ah, you know what I mean? I'm not playing tonight. You know, I'm going to sit back and fucking drink a beer, you know. But then once you get, you know, five, six days in, hey, I got a nice little run going here. Little Cal Ripken Jr., Jr., Jr. going on here, right? I want to see how long I can go. Blah 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 blah, and um, I went to the uh, I went to the store and I got a bunch of, of those little fucking plastic tins of a bunch of veggie shit and I just shoved that down my pie hole and now I got my body craving that again. I swear to God, man! I swear to God, um, the amount of people who are fucking addicted to sugar and salt um, has to be off the charts. But I might be doing that thing where um, I'm taking my life and superimposing it on everybody else's. You know what I mean? Like, well, if I suffer from this, then you must suffer from it. But I'm telling you, all I have to do is wake up in the morning, ba do ba da boop, and I eat just oatmeal with a fucking banana in it. That fills me up. And then if I go and I get a salad with a fucking protein for lunch, it's over. Then that's all it takes to kind of break that sugar salt, sugar salt, sugar salt, fucking horseshit going back and forth. Pizza, cookies, ice cream, fucking burger, fries. And you feel it. You feel yourself going off the rails, all fucking hyped up on the salt. I got to get some sugar. I got I to gotta fucking level. Yeah, you do a line of fucking sugar that levels you out. Then you wake up the next day and both of them are still fighting inside your body. And you wake up. What do you get? Huh? Do you get oatmeal? No, you grab the Fruit Loops. 
You grab the Fruit Loops, then you're walking out the door all hopped up on sugar. You take a handful of, you fucking literally empty out all the pretzels and just drink the salt at the bottom of the bag just so you can get to fucking work. You know, and then you just keep chasing it. So um, I actually talked to uh, somebody on Twitter, actually sent me a uh, little tweet saying that they started uh, eating like the salads and everything. And, and they started craving that stuff and they dropped like 20 pounds. You know, obviously, I'm no nutritional or fitness fucking guru, but I can't tell you if you just start eating that way. It's impossible. Who likes going to the fucking gym? Nobody. What would you rather do? Would you rather spend 45 fucking minutes on a treadmill or just sit down and over the course of five minutes, just eat a salad? You know, with some fucking you know, chicken breast on there or some salmon. You know, or maybe you just go like a total veggie one with some beans in there. It's fucking over. Wouldn't you rather do that than eating the shit you want to eat and then jumping on a treadmill, wearing out your hips, your knees, and your feet, fucking trying to run. I'm going to run one mile. I'm going to walk the next mile. Just eat a fucking salad. Put your feet up. Eat a salad. Last night when I watched the game, I actually was sitting in a cigar bar, so I'm killing myself that way. But as far as food goes... <laughs> I actually, um, what did I get? I ordered this beets and goat cheese salad, which back in the day, I would be like, you fucking pussy, right? I threw that thing down my throat, filled me up. I wasn't hungry. And I woke up today and, uh, you know, my alabaster stomach wasn't sticking out as far as I thought it was going to be. It made me happy. I woke up this morning happy seeing that and... What did I do? Did I have to lift a bunch of weights? They have to run up and down the fucking street. They have to do a bunch of burpees standing in the sand next to some fucking tanned up chick who's never going to fuck me. No, I didn't. I just sat in a fucking lazy boy and fueled my body with the goddamn salad. Can't recommend it enough. Having said all that, I don't know shit about nutrition, but I do know if you get a fucking beaten goat cheese salad with a little caramelized fucking <laughs> pecans in there, it's absolutely delicious. I highly recommend it. I don't want you guys walking around fucking being fat fucks. Who wants to be a fat fuck? You there in the back. You want to be a fat fuck? Well, good for you. All right, let's get, uh, let's get to the uh, other advertisement. Then I'm going to read some of these uh, letters for the week. All right, stamps.com, everybody. You know that feeling you get when you can't get things done with just the click of, of your mouse? Uh, oh, no. I read that turn around. You know that feeling you get when you can get things done with just the click of your mouse? It can't get more convenient than that. See that? I swear to God. I, my eyes are like 20 feet ahead of my mouth. So I went by the first can, and then I read the can. All right. Let me just put it in my own words. You know that feeling you get when you got your feet up and you want you got a bunch of stuff to do, but you don't even have to get off your ass? You just click a mouse. Wouldn't that be great? Well, with stamps.com, that could be yours. And now you can even get your mailing and shipping done without ever leaving your desk, thanks to Stamps.com. Yet another reason to eat a salad. You don't have to get up to go to the post office anymore. Stamps.com turns your PC or Mac into your own personal post office that never closes, that never has an attitude, that's never out of stamps. Talk about convenient. Buy and this is this, this is my fucking contractor. I swear to God, this motherfucker. Hang on a second. All right, false alarm. wasn't the contractor. And he's not a fucking contractor. He's just a guy who comes up to me and I owe a bunch more money. Hey, did you notice that the roof isn't attached to the top of the house? All right, let's get back to it here. Uh, then, okay, you, buy, you can buy, buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter or package using your computer and printer. Then just hand your mail to the mailman or drop it in the mailbox. And you'll never have to go to the post office again. I use Stamps.com to send out all of my posters. T-shirts, whatever crap I'm selling at the end of the uh, the end of my stupid show. Right now, use my last name, Burr, B-U-R-R, for this special offer, no-risk trial, plus a $110 bonus offer that includes a digital scale, calculates exact postage for letters and packages, and up to $55 free postage. Don't wait. Go to Stamps.com before you do anything else. Click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in Burr, B-U-R-R. That's Stamps.com. Enter Burr. All right, let's get to the questions for this week. All right, Japan. Uh, dear Billy, I, I'm wondering when you're going to come to Japan and if there's a reason you have not, you have spoken about the food many times as being your favorite along with Italian. The countryside is beautiful. So you could, you could get in a good hike. Uh, love you and love Nia. Well, you know what, sir? 
You tell me where I can go perform over there. Are there enough English speaking Japanese that are going to understand my humor? Because I would love to go to Tokyo. I would, I would love to go to Japan. You know what? I'm going to fucking make this happen. That's it. I'm going. You tell me where to go. You write me back. You tell me where to go. I know that there's obviously, uh, we still have bases over there from that whole World War II thing. Sorry about that, by the way. You know, I know we went a little hardcore with the second one. Um, so it's about time I come over there with a little fucking olive branch and do my stupid, uh, you know, my stupid little fucking uh, tricks there. Little somersault there, a little punchline there. Dude, I would absolutely love to go over there. Um, I, uh, you know, obviously huge fan of the food, huge fan of the fucking architecture and everything that I've seen over there, both the old and the new, that whole thing where you fucking beat all those dolphins to death. I don't know about that shit, but I'm sure you're not doing it. Whatever. Look at that. Already. We got some comedy there. I don't know shit about your country there. I said it, but I want to go. I've never been to Asia. I'd love to go over there. I'd love to go to Japan, see the great wall and all of that shit. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I know that that's in China. All right, let's not get crazy. I do. This is what I know about Asia, okay? As far as I know, the Japanese are basically the white people of Asia in that they feel that they are the most superior. And over the course of the centuries, they have tried to uh, impose their will on the other people around them. Is that true? Why would, you, why would I say this about the country that wants me to go there? Because I'm a fucking moron. Then you got Korea. You got North Korea. You got South Korea. North Korea has that uh, one of the rarest things you'll ever see in the world, which is an out of shape Asian guy running their country. Okay? The North Koreans. So all the North Korean people are starving, and this guy is walking around as basically a fat faced tub of shit. This is what kills me about this guy. Okay, if you're going to be a dictator, you know, you got to feed you. If you want it to last, I guess his dad was able to starve everybody. Dude, if I was a dictator, I would be such a good shit. No one would try to take me over. You know, I wouldn't be out there raping and pillaging. I, I would run it nice. It would be all my fucking rules, but I would be a nice guy about it. When people go, you know, we're kind of getting sick of that. I'd be like, you know, I can see that. I can see that. Not because I really see it, just because I don't want you guys to eventually come and make an attempt on my life. So, you know, what, what would you like? See, I don't have the backbone to be a dictator. And then you got China. You got a zillion fucking people, which isn't that kind of Japan's fault because we they kept invading them. So then they were like, we're going to have so many fucking people that no matter, no matter how many of us you kill, there's going to be another wave coming over. And now look at them. Goddamn air over there is like brown. What else do I know? Do I know anything positive? <clears throat> do I know anything positive? Yeah, I know something positive. Uh, all the martial arts come from there. You got yoga came up from fucking India. Uh, and I know you guys had a wonderful life until the English got there and fucked everything up, which is pretty much, you know what? That's the default answer around the world. Yeah, everything was going great. And then the English people came there and said, all right, these people here are a little bit better than those people there, a little bit better than those people there. We're running shit. And go fuck yourself, settle in for the next hundred years. And uh, then you'll force us out. Then we're going to leave. And you guys can continue fighting this fight that we created that never really existed. Because you're really all the same people who should love one another and get along. Right? Anyways, Beatles album. Bill. Dear Billy 100.7 FM. A buddy of mine recently got in an argument over which has, which has Beatles album. Do you guys even reread what the fuck you wrote? A buddy of mine recently got in an argument over which Beatles album is probably your favorite. Real in intellectual stuff going on over here. He's making fun of himself. Uh, I'm, saying, I'm saying it's Let It Be or the White Album. He's, he says it's uh, Rubber Soul. Um, oh, come on, man. How do you pick a favorite Beatles album? I mean, I definitely like their shit after... Uh, you know, they they weren't clean cut, just singing like, you know, we're shaking that baby now. I hate that shit. She loves you, yeah, yeah. Hate that shit. But when they grew out their hair and started doing drugs, I love all of that shit. Um, but it's been so long since I've listened to them. I, I, I'll have to get back to you on that one. 
What's amazing about Beatles music is the, uh, is the shit that they talk about. It's still fucking timeless. What's that one song? I'm looking through you. Where did you go? I thought I knew you. What did I know? You don't look different, but things have changed. I'm looking through you. You're not the same, right? That's just classic when you're in a fucking relationship when you're young. And you think you're really into this person. And just one day, the way they answer the phone, hi, they just do something. You just like, ugh. And you're just like, this isn't, you think they changed. It's just, you're just learning more about the person. And you're realizing like, ah, this isn't, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. Kind of like my house. <laughs> so I like that one. I also like, obviously like the White Album. I like I love Let It Be. I mean, Sergeant Pepper, man, come on. And then you got Revolver. I like all of those. You know, you know what's funny is it's been so long since those albums come out that there's a lot of young people that think the Beatles actually aren't they are overrated or they stink. And um that that's just because all that fucking music has come out since then. It completely ripped them off. It's kind of like the Richard Pryor thing where how fucking brilliant he was. And then after like the fifth or sixth season of Def Jam comedy, where everybody was doing those white people do this, black people do that shit. And it was just it turned in from Richard Pryor's specific white guy that he was doing to just that generic, oh, I got to go do my taxes. It, it just um, kind of took away some of the shit that he was doing. The only way to try to, because there's no way to go back in time. The only way to try to like, Get yourself in that headspace. Look at like a top 20, out, top 100 and see what else was in the top 10 and listen to that shit versus the Beatles album. Um, I guess that's the closest thing I would say. Um, I don't know. Who knows? Anyways. All right, Bill, I'm a female and I love your comedy. Oh, my God. Ding, 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 ding. We have a winner. Well, I'm going to be cliche and start by telling you what a huge fan I am. Ah, yeah, but, but thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I have so many female friends that the, are, the, are the epitome of what you say about them. No day off for their man or constantly want to fix or change them. I've always been pretty mellow, and from what my husband says, I am a dude trapped in a girl's body. I'm sure he might be exaggerating a bit, but it makes me smile to know he thinks that I'm cool. Oh, yeah, that's one of the best compliments you can get. If a guy, if your your boyfriend or husband or whatever thinks you're cool, um, and I know I'm not trying to be a fucking sexist cunt here, like oh you should be, oh wow, oh I'm I'm so flattered that you fucking gave me that compliment. All right, don't get your tits in an uproar here. I'm just saying if 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 the guy in your life actually if you're fun to hang out with, that's a very rare thing because usually we're trying to get away from you. Um, anyways, she says I'm rambling. Now you know for now you know for sure I'm a woman. Uh, she goes, I spoke, I saw this quote from a movie and wanted to share it with you. Uh, do not try to change him. That's why so many marriages fail. Before he removes the wedding veil, the wife starts to change the husband's happiness, his thoughts, his friends. And when she's brainwashed him and remothered him completely, she wonders what happened to the man that fascinated her, the one she fell in love with. Just a thought, uh, just thought you would enjoy that. And hopefully one of these days we'll be able to see you live. You are on our bucket list. Joking. Uh, thanks for your time. Faithful fan. Note, these two emails deal with the same situation. Might want to read both together and give one answer. Oh, that's from uh, my guy here. All right. Well, I'll read them both together then. How to change gears with a lady. Hey, Bill, I've been away from home for nine months. And whenever I get a little blue missing friends and family from back home, I just toss on your part. Ah, God, enough with the compliments. No one. Um, I appreciate them, but uh, people just want to hear the question here. I was hoping you could give me some advice. I'm living in a little house in Indonesia with a lady who I've been best friends with for six years. We're staying here for the next month. I hadn't seen this girl in over a year before we met up a few days ago. Problem is, in the last couple of days, I've totally fallen for her. Oh, Jesus. I'm not sure why I never felt this way about her until now. Probably because you're in fucking Indonesia. You know? That's probably way, probably in the middle of fucking nowhere and this is your only option. You're the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. Uh, we've always made each other laugh and always loved the same things, but we never... Th oh, my God. What am I going to do here? I'm just going to let it ring. Who answers their home phone anymore? 
Hi, my name's Bert Lunderquist, and I'm running for fucking state cunt, whatever the fuck it is. We've always made each other laugh and always loved the same things, but we never, we just never went the boy, uh, beyond a friendship. Now, I'm really jealous when I see her around other guys. So here's my big idea. I was thinking about asking her out on a date. <sighs> Why don't I have the default ringer at like two rings? Because I never do anything to make my life easy. One more. And that should be it. Dude, I fucked. Ah, you cunt. All right. Anyway, he goes, I know it's weird because we're sharing a house. And we know each other so well. But I thought it would be better to just say. Do you want to go on a date with me and then offer to take her out for dinner? Are you fucking serious? <laughs> And to see a band, oh my God, who is on the other end that isn't hanging up yet? I'm going to pick that up and it's going to go seven days. I'm not picking up. Ah, oh, thank Christ. All right. We know each other so well, but I thought it would be better to just say, do you want to go on a date with me? And then offer to take her out for dinner and to see a band like a what if this was someone I just met. Rather than make some heavy confession about my feelings. That way, it's more of a fun thing. We could try, ra we could try rather, that's more of a fun thing we could try rather than some big serious decision she has to make. I thought if she was a bit reluctant, I might try saying that our friendship is strong enough to survive one bad date. Dude, I think you're killing it right now. I would have never thought to do that. I would have been like, oh, tell her how you feel. No, fuck that. I like what you're doing. I like it way better. So am I a moron for thinking this? Absolutely not. Is this just going to make our m month together in, uh, in this place awkward and potentially ruin the trip? Should I just keep my mouth shut and try to enjoy the fact that this amazing woman is my friend? Thanks in advance, Bill. You're one of a kind. Uh, I know that I'm trying to ask. Them, blah, 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 blah. Listen, I think you should do exactly what you want to do. Who knows? Maybe these feelings are real. Maybe they're not. And, you know, you wouldn't be a man if you didn't ruin a friendship with your dick. You know, everybody does it. Everybody does it. Now, I don't know how that tied into the one above here, but uh, I think you're killing it. But as far as that quote that that woman said, um, yeah, I would agree. I would agree with that. But I also think guys do the same thing. Guys do the same. You know what? You know what also happens, I think, in a relationship is you get so comfortable if you forget to keep yourself looking good around each other. You know what I mean? Is there anything fucking worse than when you're in a relationship and your, your, your girlfriend is just comfortable coming out, just dressed like shit? And I'm not saying that she always has to get fucking dolled up. But, you know, it's the end of the night. We're going to go watch, uh, watch a fucking movie, you know? How long does it take to put on some fucking cute little pajama fucking half little hoary halter top kind of thing you can't do that it takes two seconds put your hair in a fucking ponytail bing bang boom you come out you make me feel like oh yeah all right you know i made a good choice here you know you come out and you're fucking yeah you know in that goddamn fat suit whatever the fuck you know that sweatpants and hoodie toes all fucked up i mean yeah i just it's just you know it's it's awful and then the same thing goes for the guys. You know what I mean? All of a sudden, you get a woman. You start eating fucking mozzarella sticks and all that shit. You're coming out there with your wife beater and your man tits hanging out the fucking side like John Bonham towards the end of his career. That awful fucking picture when he's sitting down. This is, this, this is a critical thing. When you're fat standing up to, all right, the last thing you need to do is fucking sit down with a wife beater on because then it's just, it's just the rolls. So they don't want to see that either. That's the thing as a guy, man. You got, you got, you know, keep yourself in good shape. Shower and all that type of shit. Just try to keep doing that throughout the fucking relationship. Coming out all fucking scruffy and bleary eyed. You know, working on a pair of man tits. Nah, women don't want to look at that. Same way we don't want to look at them looking all fucked up. So there you go. Don't take the person you're with for granted. All right, look at me, just telling everybody what the fuck to do. All right, last one I got to do, and then I got I to gotta go to work. All right. Hey, contraceptive pill bill. 
I'm coming to the end of my high school life with just a few weeks to go, and there's one girl I've been waiting to ask out for a while. Well, don't wait any longer. Uh, She's hot, smart, funny, witty. You fucking get it. But she's in a different social group to me, and I just know how I should... I just don't know how I should go about asking her out since we spent most of the past two years taking the same classes, yet I've barely talked to her. How would you go about talking to this girl that you have spent a lot of time around uh, around you? Uh, you both know each other, but you kept clear of. I feel like if I don't make a move, I'll regret not doing it for the rest of my life since she seems like she would be an ideal girlfriend. A response would be great. Love the podcast. Go fuck yourself and get your alabaster ass down to Australia soon, please. All right, dude, uh, what we should do, you should just go fucking ask her out. Because here's the thing. Nothing bad will come of that. Okay? You won't have regret. You'll fucking get over a fear, which will help you further down the line. And even if this woman says no now, who knows? Four or five years later, you run into her and she remembered that you liked her. You already broke down that fucking door. You might bang her. Or go out with her and fall in love with her after your 50-year fucking high school reunion. So this is what you do. This is what I wish I did. This is what you do right here. Fucking if she, ask her out. She says no. Just ask a bunch of them out. Get, you know, fucking lay the groundwork. You're like a salesman. You're making pussy cold calls here right now for the rest of your high school career. And then you hit every fucking reunion. And you show up with a goddamn... Fuck you have some sunglasses and a fucking white scarf wrapped around your fucking neck like a hero. And I'm telling you, you'll be fucking pulling pussy out of there like uh, like those fucking Japanese guys clubbing those fucking dolphins to death. It's a bad reference, but you know what I mean. That, that's what you should do. You should absolutely 100% ask her out or whatever. Just come walking up to her. Hey, how you doing? She knows your fucking name. She'll say hello back. And just say, hey, listen, you know, I've uh, kind of been staring at your tits the last couple of years. I don't say that. Whatever. Just fucking... Just ask her out. Just fucking ask her out. Nothing bad will come. She, even, even if she says no, she might say to her friends, you can believe who asked me out. So-and-so asked you out. And one of them's going to respect it and be like, ah, I didn't know he had that in him. Maybe one of them gets a little insecure. What? He doesn't like my rock and fucking hoo-ha. And next thing you know, you got that coming down the pike. Okay? You got to get on the phone. You got to make your calls in the morning or you don't get any sales at night. All right? That's the fucking part. That's the podcast for this week, everybody. Go fuck yourselves. Um, My prediction for the Patriots Jets. uh, If it's at the Patriots, I say we win. If it's at the Jets, um, I don't know. But I think it's going to be a close game, despite the fact that the Jets allegedly suck and all of this shit. This is the classic game where gamblers fall into just looking at the numbers and looking at the records and all of that shit. And what you have to understand is every week, what blows up your parlay? There's always that game where something happened. It makes no fucking sense. All right? The old chaos theory, like Jurassic fucking Park there. I, I, the Jets always play as tough. If we go in there and we kick the shit out of them, then they truly are a tough fucking team. Um... I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't have faith in the, the Patriots. I just feel like Tom Brady's been on his back the whole – even yesterday. I mean, that guy was on his fucking back more than I've seen. I mean, he's been on his back more this fucking season than I've seen in his goddamn career. I still think we're working that out. And Ridley went down and Mayo went down. And I don't think, obviously, they're going to be back for the Thursday game. I haven't looked at the sports page yet to see how bad it is. So uh, that's a huge blow to our defense and our running game. So uh, we got a lot closer to the fucking Jets. All right? Take that with a grain.